for environmental sweeps, the hearing was held in the Health and Human Services building. This portion's about two and a half hours. I'd like to call this hearing to order and to welcome our witnesses and our guests. On behalf of the entire subcommittee, I want to thank Secretary Thompson for enabling us to hold this field hearing in the Humphrey Building this morning. Through their unhesitating willingness to help us go forward despite continued closure of the House office buildings, the Secretary and his extraordinary staff, I was told to add extraordinary staff because my staff hasn't been so extraordinary with your staff. So. <laughs> Demonstrating once again, as they have so many times since September 11th, their determination to conduct the nation's business despite enormous challenges. We convene this hearing in an unaccustomed place to discuss an unprecedented need for vaccines to protect against the most unnatural outbreaks of disease imaginable, biological terrorism. In reaching beyond familiar places and customary ways of doing business, we heed the, the wise counsel of President Abraham Lincoln, who advised a nation facing the terror of civil war that the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves and then we shall save our country. Thinking anew requires confronting hard new realities. There is no absolute immunity to biological attack. Nature's varied and virulent arsenal of pathogens will always outnumber and outgun our immunological defenses. The prospect of genetically engineered organisms only compounds our peril. Still many people are justifiably concerned we seem medically unprepared to deter or defend against attacks using agents, anthrax and smallpox, long considered likely terrorists or biological warfare, warfare weapons. Almost two years ago, this subcommittee found the Department of Defense, DOD, anthrax vaccine immunization program overtly dependent on the sole source manufacture of a dated, logistically cumbersome medical technology. We recommended the mandatory force-wide program be scaled back while a new, more easily manufactured and more easily administered vaccine was developed. Those recommendations were not followed. Today, as the threat of anthrax infection has become a grim reality, we remain without adequate supplies of either the old or new anthrax vaccine. Witnesses today will address what is being done in the short and long term to provide greater protection against anthrax attacks. The current stockpile of smallpox vaccine is very limited and very old. A recent exercise entitled Dark Winter modeled the extreme but nevertheless plausible scenario of a multi-site smallpox attack. The exercise vividly demonstrated the critical importance of the right amount of vaccine at the right place at the right time to protect the public health. While hopefully still a remote possibility, the potentially catastrophic consequence of a smallpox outbreak have prompted accelerated efforts to develop new vaccines against the highly contagious viral disease. The anthrax and smallpox vaccine development efforts and others underway raise important questions about the future of our national bioterrorism preparedness. How much should current regulatory standards be modified to accommodate development and production of new vaccines? How can the effectiveness of immunizations be demonstrated when there is no natural occurring disease to test against? It is not ethical to expose otherwise healthy people to legal, uh, lethal pathogens. In the event of an outbreak occurs before a biological defense is fully approved, how will those receiving the inoculation be informed they are using an investigational product? If the official risk-benefit calculation degenerates into little more than anything is better than nothing, how will the public be protected from the flood of useless potions and magical anti-terrorism uh, electors to uh, appear on the Internet? To address these questions, we are fortunate to be able to call upon the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson. 
Representatives from the Department of Defense, the General Accounting Office, and the vaccine industry will also give us the benefit of their expertise and insights. I'd like to welcome again our witnesses, and Secretary Thompson, in a second, will swear you and hear your testimony, but I would like to call on our, our members, and first our senior member and the ranking member of the International Affairs Committee, International Relations Committee, Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me first commend you for your extraordinary leadership during the course of many years in calling our attention to critical issues facing the American people. If there is any member of Congress who deserves high praise, it's Christopher Shays, and I'm delighted publicly to pay tribute to you. Mr. Chairman, Excuse me, I'm just going to um, uh, once again encourage people to turn off their phones if that's what we're hearing right now. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, this past weekend I had several of my grandchildren visiting me, and I took them to the Roosevelt Memorial. The Roosevelt Memorial has a number of remarkable statements made by our great late president. And the one that has been quoted ad nauseum and ad infinitum and accurately is that there is, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I found among the quotes at the Roosevelt Memorial another one which is singularly apropos to our hearing this morning. And I would like to focus my opening remarks on that other quote. It basically says that society should not exert itself on behalf of the few who have too much, but should do its utmost to help the many who have too little. Now this has a very contemporary ring because earlier this year we dealt with a major tax package and the one issue which we have not yet approached seriously following September 11 is the imperative need in our society to revisit a lopsided tax package that provided enormous benefits for the wealthiest amongst us and very little for the people who are in the low and middle income brackets. Now, we are looking at everything anew following September 11. The cliche is that this is a whole new world. But the one thing that has received very little attention is the need to revisit the allocation of the basic resources of this society. I find that, in a sense, this became quite obvious when members of Congress were given far quicker response than employees of the U.S. Postal Service when we face this particular crisis. And I would like to suggest to all of us uh, on, the, on the congressional panel here and to all of our colleagues that since very few of us understand the technical complexities of the issues we deal with in this entire field, our responsibility is to deal with policy issues. Uh, Mr. Secretary, yesterday the President of the American Public Health Association criticized the administration's program of $300 million and called for a minimum of a billion in this field. Mm -hmm. This is just the beginning of a whole range of gigantic demands on the public purse. Congress has shown itself more than willing to step up to the plate and to vote any amount we need to provide security for the American people. But the time has come to re-examine an initially misguided tax package which now looks nothing short of obscene. The American people will simply not stand for re-examining all the ramifications of our lives following September 11, 
but not touch a tax package which so unfairly and in a, in a singularly inappropriate fashion singles out the wealthiest amongst us for benefits. I would very much hope that you will use your influence within the cabinet, and you have a great deal of influence, and I can assure you many of us will use our very limited influence at the White House um, to deal with this issue because the full range of requirements way beyond the issue we are discussing this morning will have to have the support of the American people and it will not have that support unless there is a feeling of fairness in terms of sacrifice, contribution, and commitment. Thank, um, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Putnam. And let me thank the, the gentleman, the Vice Chairman, who has been very active on this committee and has played a major role. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for the leadership that you have shown in holding a number of hearings on terrorism and on bioterrorism. And I welcome our distinguished panel, although I am curious as to what they can contribute to our discussion on tax policy and the previous uh, legislation that the Congress has taken up and, and passed out with overwhelming support regarding the nation's tax policy. We're here to discuss the biological threats that are out there, the status of the threat that this nation faces, and, and how equipped we are to deal with an outbreak. And that's something that Secretary Thompson has a good deal of experience in and has certainly gained a great deal more in in the previous several weeks. Uh, we have had a number of hearings that have pointed out some of the shortcomings of our government's uh, preparedness and the limited capacity to produce uh, sufficient quantities of vaccine, and we look forward to hearing the status of, of that production capacity. We are in a, in a new world. We are in a new situation uh, where together, pulling in the same direction, uh, moving towards a common goal, we can assure the public that we are adequately prepared, that we do have sufficient stockpiles of vaccine, that we have developed adequate protocols of prophylaxis and treatment to, to meet this new threat. And that's what it is, is a new threat. Uh, I think that the, it will require new, new resources. It will require reprioritization of what had been the direction that the government and the budget uh, policies were taking. Uh, but I do take some exception to the fact that, that an accusation has been laid out there that Congress has somehow been treated differently. Uh, every American should know that they have access to the best health care system in the world, headed up by the most dedicated professionals uh, from the CDC level right down to the local hospital. And the, the background that this committee has developed through a succession of hearings has established that we, we do have the finest public health system, and there are ways for us to continue to reinforce the effort that those hardworking men and women put into this, improving surveillance techniques, improving the dissemination of information to be on the lookout for things like anthrax and smallpox and Botox and bubonic plague. And those are areas where hopefully together we can continue to take this hearing working hand in hand with the administration, with both sides of the aisle, with both chambers, to move forward for the American people. With that, I, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the, thank the gentleman. I'd call on uh, Mr. Sanders, who has been with this committee at almost every hearing, and I thank the gentleman. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the leadership that you have shown in this whole area, and we welcome the Secretary to be with us today. Uh, as the Chairman indicated when he began, we are meeting in an unusual facility for us at an unusual time and dealing with a subject that I think many of us would have hoped never to have to deal with. But I think as Americans and as the United States government, is it, a, it is imperative for us now to take the hardest look that we can at the most nightmarish uh, situations that we can imagine. I think that's what the American people want, and they want us to come up with the best solutions that we can come up with. This is not pleasant. Uh, we're not happy about it, but that's something that we have to do. Uh, let me tell you just very briefly uh, some of uh, the areas that uh, I am uh, concerned about. Number one, uh, that in fact we have to lay out what the plans may be of fiendish minds who want to destroy Americans. And it's not a pleasant intellectual scenario to get into, but we have to do that. 
And then we have to determine from a counterterrorism point of view, how can we prevent the implementation of those plans? Uh, there is in the report uh, information that we have received from the committee uh, indications that a 1993 report by the U.S. Congressional Office of Technology Assessment estimated that between 130,000 and 3 million deaths could follow the uh, aerosolized release of 220 pounds of anthrax spores upwind of the Washington, D.C. area. In other words, it is conceivable that somebody flying in a uh, two-seat passenger plane uh, can do horrendous damage to this country. How do we stop that? Very difficult, uh, but questions that we have got to ask. Um, in the event that a tragedy occurs, how do we make certain that our people are immunized? Um, if people become sick, what procedures are in place to treat them? The truth of the matter is, and let me disagree with uh, my friend a moment ago who talked about our system being the strongest in the world. In many ways, we are not the strongest healthcare system in the world. If, God forbid, a disaster struck us today in a large city, do we really believe that millions, and pe millions of people know where to go in a short period of time to get the medicine that they need? We have 44 million people who have no health insurance whatsoever. We have tens of millions of people who don't know who their physician is. We do not, in fact, have a strong public health infrastructure in this country, and I think we should use this crisis to build one so that if, God forbid, there is a tragedy, and if we are able, and I'm sure the Secretary will talk about this, get the medicine and the drugs out to people to make sure that those drugs are distributed in a way that people can calmly receive them rather than develop a sense of panic about where they go and, and so forth. The other issue uh, that I want to touch upon, Mr. Secretary, and you know that this is an issue of deep concern to me, is the role of the pharmaceutical industry in this whole situation. Mm -hmm. I am concerned that have been concerned for years that the pharmaceutical industry remains year after year the most profitable industry in this country and that they charge the people in the United States by far the highest prices in the world. Now that may be a discussion for another day, but what is appropriate today, if we are dealing with Cipro and if we are dealing with vaccines, it is incumbent upon our government to tell the pharmaceutical industry that they can forget about their profits that we need that product, as much of that product as we need, as quickly as possible, and we need it at a cost that is affordable for individuals and for the United States government. You are aware, no doubt, that the Canadian government said to Bayer, I guess, who manufactures Cipro, uh, thank you, but no thank you, we will do a generic. My understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that in India there is a generic that sells for three cents a pill uh, compared to what an American consumer the four or five dollars that American consumer would pay going to a drugstore here. Now, if that is true, there is something to be learned from that. My point here, sir, is that we've got to protect the American people and not pharmaceutical industry profits, and we've got to tell them to come online and work with us. So there are a whole lot of issues out there. This is an uncharted territory. I know that you, Mr. Secretary, are working as hard as you can, and we will work with you. Uh, and let's see if we can go forward to make sure that the American people have the protection to which they are entitled. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, and then we'll get to you, Mr. Secretary. I recognize the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Kucinich. And I, I'm learning that these mics are very, uh, you don't need to get too close to them. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. and. Um, I appreciate the work that you have done over the many years in calling this country's attention to the challenges that could be presented by uh, biological warfare. Uh, while I intend to be fully involved in the questioning, I'd like to uh, confine my remarks to kind of like the climate that we're in. Um, last week, Congress left the Capitol under the uh, threat of a biological attack, anthrax. And I think that the American people at this time are looking for stability from their government. They're looking for certainty from their government, and we're going to have to do the best we can to provide that. We have to keep in mind that despite the fact that we have had buildings that have been contaminated, that this is a government of the people. 
not a government of buildings. And we can decontaminate buildings. We can make sure that buildings are secure. But we can never lose that commitment to government of the people and be coward by terrorists or panicked or turn against each other in moments of uncertainty. The underlying and fundamental unity which created this country is a good place for us to always begin from. Whether we're Democrats or Republicans, whether we're Congress or the administration, we have to appeal to that fundamental unity, the thing that holds us together as a nation, so that there will be no challenge that will be so grave that it cannot be met without splintering this government or this country. I have confidence that this administration and this Congress will work together to meet the challenge of dealing with biological, chemical, or any other kind of terrorism. But we must be resolute in our intention to see that those principles of government of the people are not shaken to their foundation in moments of uncertainty and even panic. We're a stronger country than that. And so with that in mind and in that spirit, I look forward to hearing from the witnesses and look forward to this opportunity to see what we may be able to do to better secure our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're a patient man, Mr. Secretary, and you are someone who fortunately uh, is where you are. And what we will do is um, just take care of this business and then we'll swear you in and we'll hear from your statement. Uh, uh, I just need to ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to insert their prepared statements into the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. Without objection, so ordered. And I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to insert an opening statement into the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. Um, Mr. Secretary, with you is Dr. Uh, uh, Anthony Fauci uh, from uh, NIH and Dr. Scott Lillybridge, Special Assistant for Bioterrorism from your office, I believe. And we'll ask all three of you to stand and we'll swear you in and then we'll hear your statement. Thank you. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Mr. Secretary, thank you for honoring us with your presence. You have as much time as you'd like. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Shays. And let me um, echo what other members of the committee have already said. Congratulations and thank you for your leadership in this area. It's uh, very much appreciated by me personally, and I know by the nation, and I thank you. I also want to thank uh, Congressman Kucinci and uh, Sanders and Tom Lantos and Adam Putnam for being here and appreciate your dedication. I appreciated all of your opening statements and I hope to respond to most of the things that have already been uh, announced by the members. And I thank you very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. And thank you for coming down from the Hill to the HHS building. I will try to make you feel at home. The president and the entire administration are committed to preventing bioterrorism. Our rapid and effective reports and efforts on September 11th and the days immediately following have certainly demonstrated that commitment. <coughs> and even before then, I had been working vigorously with Dr. Scott Lillibridge, who's the gentleman on my right, one of the nation's leading experts on bioterrorism. I asked him to join my team and come up from CDC in Atlanta and have his office right next to my office on the sixth floor. And since June, he has become my special assistant for national security and bioterrorism on domestic preparedness. And on my left is Anthony Falci, who is, of course, is the director of NIH of Eldry and Infectious Diseases, and the, I believe the foremost scientist in the world on vaccines. And I think he is uh, eminently qualified to answer any and all questions dealing with that, with that subject. That's characteristic of the seriousness with which the President of the United States and this administration have since taking office and taken the need for preparedness. That ability to respond has been tested. 
on September 11th, and more recently with the current anthrax investigations. Let me emphasize that we have worked together with our partners across all levels of government, from the Federal Bureau of Investigation to the United States Postal Service, from local hospitals to county governments, to address these more recent terrorist events. And soon after the first case of anthrax exposure in Florida, the Department of Health and Human Services through the CDC alerted all public health departments in the country to be on the lookout for anthrax-like symptoms, including those associated with inhalation and cutaneous. As you know, anthrax is not contagious. Contracting inhalation anthrax, for example, is fundamentally different from exposure to the agent. You would have to inhale 8,000 to 10,000 spores of anthrax into your lungs before actually coming down with the disease. So simply having anthrax spores in one's nose does not mean that you are infected with anthrax. The drug ciprofloxin, commonly known by its brand name Cipro, is effective in the treatment of inhalation anthrax even after infection. And Representative Sanders, I want you to know that I made that crystal clear to Bayer that we will not accept the price that they offered and we will be negotiating this afternoon. And I'm sure you will be, I hope you will be satisfied with the outcome. We have taken and continue to take every precaution and we have made Cipro available to the widest number of people suspected of being exposed to inhalation anthrax. But other drugs such as doxycycline and penicillin have been approved by FDA as treatments for anthrax and they're generic. The FDA's approval will include instructions on what dose to use and how long to treat the inhalation form of anthrax. The CDC has asked that local hospitals in and around the nation's capital pay particular attention to any suspicious respiratory or skin infections. We at the department have been monitoring hospitals in the area and are closely monitoring the cases of two postal workers who are infected with inhalation anthrax in the District of Columbia. And we're all deeply saddened by the deaths of two local postal employees whose deaths have been linked to anthrax. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families. And throughout the past month, the CDC and local public health departments have been working hard to trace back the source of the anthrax-tainted letters that have been received in this country. They've used the best science to follow the trail of these letters, and they've used the best science to assess the risk of anthrax exposure to employees, both at the workplaces where the letters were received and at the postal facilities where the letters passed through. Public health officials are relying heavily on science as they track these letters. Identify those who may have been exposed and determine a course of treatment. These efforts were evident in the Florida and New York cases where the letters were identified and those who may have been exposed were tested and treated. The CDC has done a good job of finding the letters in question and getting treatment to those at risk. The work of the CDC has likely saved many from serious illness and death. We have good science, but it is also, ladies and gentlemen, an evolving science. Remember, we have never had cases of anthrax attacks in this manner before. It is a new challenge that we are all facing as a country. We also need to get ahead of the science. We will be even more, gentlemen, aggressive in securing the safety of our postal workers who may have been exposed to a tainted letter. CDC, the union, and the postal authorities are meeting this afternoon in order to find ways to better secure the safety of all employees. And therefore, I am making it clear today to this committee and to the American public, the Centers for Disease Control, that when a case of anthrax does emerge, we will immediately move in at any and all postal facilities that might have handled that piece of mail. We will build the scientific link between the post office of the postmark and the recipient of the letter. In other words, we'll not only immediately begin testing and treatment at the site where the letter was received, but simultaneously begin testing and treatment at all postal facilities through which that letter may have passed. And we will make medicine immediately available to those employees 
who may have been at risk of exposure. We have plenty of antibiotics to treat anthrax, and we're going to err on the side of caution and making sure people are protected. I ask for the cooperation and partnership of local public health departments in this endeavor. We're also going to lend the United States Postal Service our scientific expertise in developing ways to protect postal workers as they sort and deliver the mail, as well as what technology might help in making mail rooms more safe. We've been assisting the Postal Service from the onset, and we're going to continue to make our resources and expertise available to them. And we're having a meeting this afternoon to finalize and to be able to improve those terms. Postal workers have a tough job. And it's a job that becomes even tougher in some parts of the country. But we're going to ease their burden by going to the greatest lengths to make sure that their health is protected. If we even remotely suspect that an anthrax-tainted letter may have passed through a facility, we're going to get there, test the facility, and make the appropriate treatment available to those who may have been exposed. We're going to act quickly and, if need be, let the science catch up to our actions. If it turns out postal workers did not come in contact with anthrax spores, we can always take them off the antibiotics. Never has our nation's public health surveillance been more important. And the dedicated public servants in the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the public health officials in all of our local communities, are committed to being even more thoroughly prepared to respond tomorrow than we are today. And I know. I know some critics are charging that our public health system is not prepared to respond to a major bioterrorism attack. And I know that some state and local labs are feeling overwhelmed right now as they respond to people's natural fears about what might be waiting in their mail. And I understand that our local first responders are also feeling overburdened. But the response from state and local authorities to each and every threat is continuing and will continue. And we should be proud of how well everybody has responded to events that have broken our hearts, even as they have steeled our resolve. But we must continue our efforts to be better prepared for future events. So an effort to ensure the department is fully prepared and better coordinated, I recently announced the creation of a bioterrorism advisory committee in my office. And Dr. D.A. Henderson, who certainly is renowned for his role, and eradicating smallpox heads that committee. Dr. Henderson and his staff will provide seasoned advice to the department on all bioterrorism activities, including efforts to improve state and local preparedness. And just this last week, President Bush requested an additional $1.5 billion to strengthen our ability to prevent and respond to a bioterrorism attack. Of the total funds requested, two-thirds are being designated for the production of vaccines and antibiotics. In addition, the President has requested $300 million for improving state and local readiness, which specifically includes $122 million for training communities and distribution of the medicines during an emergency, Representative Sanders. We must accelerate the production of vaccines and antibiotics. And we must invest in essential programs to ensure the speedy and orderly distribution of antibiotics and other supplies in the event of a major bioterrorism event. The President's request includes $643 million to expand the national pharmaceutical stockpile and $509 million to speed the purchase of 300 million doses of smallpox. And with these resources, HHS will expand its program capabilities to respond to an all-hazardous event. As you all know, there are currently eight pushbacks, each consisting of 50 tons of medical supplies available as part of the stockpile. Each one includes no less than 84 separate types of supplies, things like antibiotics, needles and IVs, a tablet counting machine, and oxygen mask. And each pushback provides a full course of antibiotics and other medical supplies and is able to be shipped to an area within 12 hours to help state and local response efforts. 
we were able to deliver one pushpack into New York City on September 11th within seven hours. These pushpacks have enough drugs to treat two million individuals for inhalation anthrax following exposure. I have directed that the stockpile development should be increased for inhalation anthrax so that 12 million persons can be treated. CDC will reach that level of response within the next 12 months. I also want to point out the President signed an executive order yesterday urging us to go ahead quickly on this program. With the additional resources, we will also add four more push packages to a total of 600 tons of medical supplies from the current eight and have them strategically located across the country, making more emergency supplies available and augmenting our existing supplies. The President and my department are also committed to the development and the approval of new vaccines and therapies. The CDC, the Food and Drug Administration, and the National Institute of Health, all agencies within HHS are collaborating with the Defense Department and other agencies to support and encourage research to address the scientific issues related to bioterrorism. The capability to detect and counter bioterrorism depends to a significant degree on the state of relevant medical science. Our continuing research agenda in collaboration with CDC, FDA, NIH, and DOD is critical to our overall preparedness. So let me outline several other areas that our budget requests. The pres President is calling for $88 million to expand our capacity to respond to bioterrorism and the incidents including $20 million for the CDC's rapid response in advanced technology and specialty labs, which provide quick identification of the suspected agents and the technical assistance to state labs. Also included in this amount is $20 million to support additional expert epidemiology teams that can be sent to states and cities to help them respond quickly to infectious disease outbreaks and other public health risks. And let me reiterate my conviction personally that every state should have at least one federally funded epidemiologist who has graduated from the Epidemic Intelligence Service Training Program like Scott Lulabridge has. Every state health department, I believe, should have one. The President is also asking for $50 million to strengthen the Metropolitan Medical Response System to increase the number of large cities that are able to fully develop their MMRS units. It is imperative that we work closely with cities to ensure that their MMRS units have the proper equipment and training, increasing that from 97 to 122. We're also providing $50 million to assist hospitals and emergency departments in preparing for and responding to incidents requ requiring mass immunizations and treatment. And we're providing $10 million to augment state and local preparedness by providing training to state health departments on bioterrorism as well as emergency response. The President is also requesting $40 million to support early detection surveillance to identify potential bioterrorism agents, which includes web-based disease notification to the health community nationwide. This amount will provide for the expansion of our health alert network, more commonly referred to as HOND, which helps early detection of disease to 75 percent of the nation's 3,000 counties. I wish and hope to have all counties connected in the coming years. We're providing $15 million to support the increased capacity in no less than 78 laboratories in 45 states. This funding will enhance our ability to identify and detect all critical biological agents, and we're implementing a new hospital preparedness effort to ensure that our health facilities have the equipment and training they need to respond to mass casualty incidents. Finally, as to food safety, the President is also requesting $61 million to enhance the frequency and the quality of imported food inspections and to modernize the import data system to enable us to detect tainted food. This funding will also provide for 410 new FDA inspectors to help ensure that our food is better protected. The administration has sent to Congress legislation to strengthen our ability to protect the nation's food supply. 
This measure will require prior notice of imported food shipments, enhancing our ability to inspect food, allowing for detention of food suspected of being tainted, and providing flexibility for the FDA to approve drugs and other treatments for dealing with illness resulting from biological attacks. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by noting that despite the events of recent days, every American must and should continue to live their lives. Working, spending time with family, having a meal out, or shopping at the local mall. And they should be able to do that with confidence. American citizens can be sure that their government agencies, local, state, and federal, are ready to respond to biological warfare and bioterrorism quickly and effectively throughout the country. None of us enjoys contemplating bioterrorism, but as responsible public servants, doing so is a matter of fulfilling the public's trust in us. And under the leadership of President Bush, we're taking all the steps necessary to keep America safe in an era when biological and chemical attacks are as possible as they are unthinkable. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me speak about this matter of critical importance. And now I'm glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your uh, thorough statement. I, um, again, want to thank you for allowing us to uh, uh, use your facility and also uh, to uh, thank you again for your presence here before the committee. Uh, it's the intention of the chairman to have five-minute questions for each member. Uh, and then um, we'll do a second round where we'll go 10 minutes uh, if any member wants to. Uh, I, I just want to set up the stage for my question. I mean, we've had three commissions that have come before our committee, the Gilmore Commission, the Bremer Commission, the Hart Rudman Commission, and all of them have basically said to, to this committee and, and in their reports that we haven't had a proper assessment of the th terrorist threat that we don't have a strategy to deal with it, and we aren't organized to effectively implement a strategy. Now, that's what they said last year, and obviously things have changed. You, you have the president who has put Tom Ridge in charge of reorganizing to, to maximize our effort. Um, we, we recognize that you know, the, best, the best thing that could happen is that we would detect and prevent an attack. Uh, whether it was catastrophic or sand in the gears, which is really what we have right now. We, we, we have in that process uh, a, a crisis if an attack is underway and how does the government deal with it. And then, then we have, uh, if an event occurs, we have the, the criminal justice system trying to discover, you know, where this attack happened, who's responsible, and, and, and so on, and who do we hold accountable. Uh, I would parenthetically say, though, I view all of this not as a criminal action. I view it as an act of war. I think we are at war. Um, and, and, and then we come to what we call the crisis management, where FEMA comes into play and so on. I put you pretty much in that category of the crisis has occurred. Right. And um, uh, this hearing is to look at the, the role vaccines play in civilian preparedness. Uh, and, and you're free to speak on anything, and members obviously, uh, being members, are free to ask anything they want, and I know you'll respond uh, as you choose. But one of the things we want to know is what are the near and long-term roles of vaccines and preparedness against biological uh, warfare and terrorism? How adaptable is the current regulatory process to the development and approval of biowarfare defense vaccines? That's kind of the thrust of the hearing. Fine. And so in, 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 with that in, as the thrust, I'm interested to know, do you plan or, or recommending that we vaccinate the entire U.S. Pop population for, uh, say, a smallpox outbreak? No, we do not. If, if I could just set my response a little bit longer than just that sure. quick response, if, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want everybody to know that right now, as soon as a, as a consequence happens, we would immediately put in order uh, and put on notice our 7,000 DMAT, 7,000 individuals that belong to our 90 DMAT teams throughout the United States. As soon as a crisis happens, they contact the state health department who contacts CDC. We would send immediately some epidemiologists from Atlanta to that locale, and they would work in cooperation with the local hospital, the local emergency workers, and the state health to develop a plan. 
they would then call us with that plan in the Humphrey building. We got a, a huge room downstairs set aside in which we have people like Scott Lillibridge and other professionals around. And that's on the sixth floor, and I hope you go down and look at it before you leave today, members of the committee. And then they would send out whatever they need as far as uh, extra personnel as well as medical supplies. In regards to your specific question on vaccination, we have, as you know, 15.4 million dosage of, of smallpox vaccine right now. And Dr. Tony Falci is doing a, a research on right now to determine if we could dilute that down five to one or 10 to one. 10 to one, you would only have an effective rate of about 70%. Five to one, we think it's gonna be around 90%. And that would be very effective, 90 to 95 percent. And we would then have 77 million dosage. And that has been analyzed by Tony Falci and the people out at NIH. And they say it's very potent and very effective. We have enough diluent and, and uh, needles to handle the 15.4 million dosage of smallpox. We are in the process. We sent out what is called a request for information. I met with the pharmaceutical companies, several of them last week, and seven companies now have indicated they would like to get involved in issuing some sort of a bid to produce smallpox vaccine. Could I, just before, how much time do I have left? Uh, could I just ask you in this sure. regard, the, um, after you've done your experimentation with animals, um, you, you have to go through one phase where you do, you know, a, a handful of, of uh, on protocol, human protocol, protocol. The, for initial safety and, and, immu and, and to see how well they, it immunizes. And then you go to phase two, which could take two years to much longer with several hundred patients uh, to, to, to determine its safety and efficacy. And then you go to phase three, where you're dealing with even more. And it's hard for me to know how we can reach a timetable of, you know, in That's two years. That's why Dr. Falci is here, because we have already worked that out, okay. Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me just say, uh, after your answer, sure. then I'll go to Mr. Kucinich. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what we're talking about is trying to expand uh, the availability and dosage of an already approved vaccine. So it's a different story from having to go. We're talking about the dilutional studies on smallpox. Let me just be clear. Is this a, 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 the vaccine that right. the was fifth, used yeah, 20, 30 years Absolutely. This is, this is the highly effective vaccine that we used to vaccinate routinely for until 1972. And in 1972, it was discontinued. We have 15.4 million doses in the U.S. government reserve. That is already an approved vaccine. The studies that were done preliminarily on 60 individuals compared a broad range of dilutions. We took the undiluted, which we know works, decades of history tells us it works. Their safety, obviously, there are some issues that we could discuss about the risk benefit of that because there are un uncommon but nonetheless potentially serious toxicities just, with let that. Let me just interrupt you a second sure. and say that though this is an an older vaccine, which is truly not as pure. It's, it's there, and it, it need, and it is approved. But, right. but aren't we ultimately we look, are. looking yeah. to produce a new vaccine? There, there are. There are and what, that's really what I was addressing. Exactly. We have an immediate plan to answer the questions, what happens if something happens a month, a week, three, years, three months from now? What happens if something happens six months to a year? And the department, under Secretary's leadership, has tasked us to put together a plan which addresses the immediate the intermediate and the long range. The question you asked about the initial doses of the diluted one, that's the immediate plan. So you have 15.4 million doses. We did a preliminary study last spring where we compared the undiluted with one to 10, with one to 100. We found out that one to 100 dilution didn't work very well, not very significant take. And let me explain because I know that the, the question you asked is very relevant. This is something that's tested for safety and take rate. And by take rate, we mean to get that characteristic skin reaction, which traditionally and historically has been highly correlated with protection against smallpox infection. We'll never be able to do a challenge study because it would be unethical and unthinkable to challenge someone with smallpox. So we're asking, what is the safety in the diluted uh, component? And what is the take rate on that preliminary study we found that it was about 70% take rate. Since that, we felt, was not adequate enough, 
we redesigned a larger study, which is a 650 patient study. The screening has started. The vaccinations will start within a few weeks. In that study, we compare 1 to 10 with 1 to 5 with undiluted. Since we know in the previous study that we got 70 percent take rate is, on the is, one. Is this with animals that we're doing? No, this is human, sir. Okay. Yeah, and this is not a phase one study. This is called a phase four study because it's done with an already approved product. Okay. Let me just say this to you. I'm a little uneasy given that I'm the chairman here uh, going over my right. five minutes, but I, I do want this, this issue, so I'll allow the other members to have the same amount of time. Right. The, um, I, I, I just want to separate uh, the the old method that's in storage, right. mm -hmm. uh, you haven't yet addressed the new, and I don't even want you to yet because that's a longer right. issue, and we'll take it up later. But since you started with the existing stock, right. if you don't have smallpox, um, uh, a an outbreak, how are you able to really uh, determine its efficacy? Yeah. Because you can't, you know, you can't inflict people with smallpox right. to see if it works. And, and and let me try to explain that. As I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, we have a lot of historical experience that when you get a take, namely you have the characteristic reaction, those I take again? A take is when, if I, if I get a, a vaccination and I put the drop on my shoulder, it, many of us who were born before 1972, if you look on your shoulder, you see a very faint little scar. And what then is a little, little prickly type scar. And what happens is you put a drop on your shoulder and you take a typical classical needle, a bifurcated needle, and you put about 15 jabs until there's a little bit of blood in an area about five millimeters. After, if it's a primary, you haven't been vaccinated before, or if it's someone like you or I who have been vaccinated before, we would have a secondary take. My daughters would have a primary take. And what that would mean is that after a period of time, you'd have the gradual evolution of what looks like a pustule inflamed and then a scab and then ultimately the scab falls off. We know that that is correlated with protection. So even though we can't and should not challenge someone, we have in extraordinary historical information that that take is associated with protection. So the studies that we're doing, and let me just finish briefly what I was saying, that the ones that have just recently started that will be finished by the beginning of the year, the end of January, the beginning of the February, will determine if you compare the undiluted, which we know works, with a 1 to 5 and a 1 to 10. And we, for example, the 1 to 5, let's say it gives us a 90 percent take. It's not an unreasonable assumption, but we have to do the experiment first before we can give you that information. But if the 1 to 5 gives you a very good take rate and is safe, then you have the potential for over 75 million doses available to you. That's the immediate plan. And as you mentioned, we can go later on into what the intermediate and long range is. Let me just is. summarize what I believe you basically right. have said in, in the answer, that, that uh, there is no intention to have uh, a, a universal vaccination program for correct. smallpox. Correct. Correct. Uh, that could only happen, obviously, if we had a new production with a, with a new vaccine, which we are, my understanding, we're moving forward with that. And I'll get, we'll, our other members may get to that question. But in terms of the existing stock, you're basically saying the 12 million that is in 15.4. Well, 12 is in great shape correct. and 3 yeah. million yeah. is right. questionable. Sure. Okay. But if we use the 15, that you think ultimately that you're going to see a one to f a, f a five time uh, um, five to one five to yeah, one. one one to five, five. It's an, and and this will be FDA approved. It is not unreasonable to assume that the one to five, but we have to do the study. I mean, that's the reason we have to do it. And at, will be FDA yeah, approved. Okay. Yeah. You, you, okay, so in other words, by you're saying it, not that you're ordering them to, but that that you won't move forward unless it's FDA approved. Right. Mr. The FDA is going to be involved. I'm just, I'm just, yeah. I just want to make I'm sure. Sorry. Yeah, the FDA will be involved in looking at the safety and the take rate. So, so the idea about were there any unusual reactions when you diluted it? Was there something that was not predictable? So there certainly will be FDA involvement. This isn't something that we do it and then just give it. Okay. Well, if okay. I could, could yes, I just sir. say something really quick? We have, we have increased the purchase from a canvas from 40 million doses to 54. Yes. That's the one that has the, con the exclusive contract. And they have indicated that they will have that delivered to us by next July. 
Right, but, but I, I don't want to get on the new one yet, Mr. Secretary, okay. just because it raises questions about, you know, I'd be here another 20 minutes with you. Okay, I, I used at least 10 minutes, and Mr. Kucinich, you had 10 minutes. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I want to explore the connection between um, threat assessment, incidents, and government response, if I may. Uh, first of all, to just put things in perspective here. Does the administration have any information that the incidents of reports of anthrax are more widespread than the incidents that we've seen reported at the various media outlets and in the Capitol here? Uh, and, and Congressman, some of that stuff is classified, and I don't think we should be discussing it in this, in, in this. Well, we need to know that. I mean, wouldn't but, but it would be comforting for the American people to know, to the, to is this a widespread right. problem, or is it, is it fairly localized? To the best of our knowledge, it is, it is what we've seen so far. We have, we have no intel that's saying that this is going to be a wider spread thing, but we have to be prepared <clears throat> for it, Congressman. I understand, uh, but uh, when we're speaking of threat assessment, we're speaking of something that at this point is localized. That is, that is the best of our information at this point in time, but uh, we are preparing for something much more dramatic. And you're in contact with, obviously, the FBI concerning threat assessments and being able to analyze so that you can prepare accordingly. That is correct. But there are two paths currently going on, the criminal path and the public health path. And we are responding to the public health pass, and the FBI is doing the criminal investigations in Florida and New York and in Trenton and Washington. But you don't see anything, or do you see anything, which would favor a mass uh, stockpiling or uh, prophylactic consumption of Cipro or any other drug that's related? We, we feel that to be on the prudent side, it is imperative for us to increase the amount of purchase from uh, antibiotics that would treat 2 million people for 60 days up to 12 million people. And we feel that it's also advisable, even though we have no knowledge or basis at this point in time for any kind of smallpox, to have 300 million doses of smallpox vaccine just in case it ever did break out because it's so contagious. There's no connection, though, between that no, and, and a threat assessment. There is not. This is just you saying, well, you know, if, what if this happens? We have to be prepared. Let's be prepared. But you don't have any information that suggests that there's any kind of You're, a reason for the American people to be concerned that suddenly smallpox that is, is going correct. to be a reality in their communities. That is correct. A few weeks ago, when the first discussion began to surface about anthrax, I remember a report, um, I think at least I'm, I'm pretty sure this is what I heard, that there was a, a theft of some anthrax from a government lab. Had you heard of that at all? We have heard of it, but uh, we have also found out that there's a there's a lot of rumors going on, a lot of the rumors that we found. We do not know about that. Well, let's go that. back to, to threat assessment and the role of uh, Health and Human Services. Are, are you aware of where any biological agents that could be used against people anywhere are in the control right now of various government laboratories? We, uh, we are absolutely certain that there is a biological agents in government laboratories because they're doing research on them, Congressman. Right. Okay. Did you ever talk to the people who are doing research on these, um, on anthrax, on smallpox, on botulism, or any of these others about the security of, of that and the connection between that security and public health concerns? Uh, I certainly have. In fact, I went down to CDC and uh, went through the laboratories down there, and I'm be spending a couple days next week down at CDC, Congressman, uh, doing just that. We also looked at the uh, IG report, which I had done, uh, to take a look at laboratory security. 
and we have increased the laboratory security in all of all of CDC and NIH labs and we're asking for some more money in this appropriation to improve it even more so. Uh, is there I any am not satisfied if that's what you're asking of the laboratory security presently. It's much better than it was uh, uh, three months ago and it'll be a much better if we uh, get the as necessary money to do so. Could we have that report submitted for the record? Sure. Thank you. Be because since we're, we're talking about threat assessment here, we should be aware of what the government itself may possess that could create some problems. And so no, I'd, I'd, I'd also like to ask you, Mr. Secretary, uh, you articulated a number of agencies you've been in touch with. Have you been in touch with for example, the Department of Defense relative to any research that's going on in the Department of Defense and the security of those uh, uh, defense-related matters where they might be looking into uh, different types of, of warfare. We have, uh, let me answer it in two ways. First off, we have the most virulent viruses in the world in our laboratories. That's what I'm concerned about. We have, I mean, we're the only, only ones that are really, we and the Russians are the only ones that are supposed to have smallpox smallpox virus. I said we are supposed to. <laughs> well, have we, have, we, have there and, been any discussions, we, excuse me, Mr. Secretary, have there been any discussions about maybe destroying these uh, viruses that, yes, uh, that we have uh, currently within our own control so that they don't get into there has uh, been wrong many, hands? There has been many discussions, but uh, while somebody else has uh, the virus, we do not feel that it is the proper thing to do to destroy our virus. Uh, and in regards to the intel, uh, Congressman, uh, we have co intel coming in from all sources into our room downstairs, and I hope you will avail yourself to go downstairs and take a look at this after the hearing. And we have intelligence coming in from the Department of Defense, from CIA, FBI, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. I, I want to go back to something now. Yeah. Uh, you know, as one of the, some of the wonderful work we do in this committee, we have the opportunity to see uh, that, you know, sometimes the Department of Defense, which does the best job it can, can't account for various defense materiel. It's just so big. It's hard to keep track of rocket launchers and boats and airplanes and things like that. So I want to go back to something you said about the biological and chemical agents Mm -hmm. which, as you said, might be some of the most powerful and something to that effect in, in the world. Why, if we have reports that some of this material, anthrax, has been spirited away or suspected to be spirited away or reports indicate have been spirited away from a government lab, um, in addition to the security aspect, Spir why, why, don't we, why don't we destroy these, unless we're not certainly intending to use them against some civilian population somewhere, I would imagine. I don't think that, I, I don't believe anybody's ever suggested that. So why don't we destroy any, and, and why don't you, as the, uh, as the secretary, uh, who's concerned about public health, uh, lead the effort to destroy any kind of agents which may exist right now within our own country that if they got out of control would be like opening Pandora's box. We are confident that the smallpox virus we have is all there and accounted for on a regular basis and there's none been missing. In regards to why we have If I may, Mr. Secretary, and I appreciate that answer. You know, no, let, let him answer. Okay, please the go ahead. The reason we have it is because other country, at least one other country has it. And we need that virus in order to do the necessary research, in order to be able to build an antibiotic or a vaccine for the mutation that may take place in other viruses. So if we had destroyed ours and another country had the smallpox virus, they could mutate it and produce a smallpox that we could not, we could not have a vaccine. Therefore, we need this to protect America and protect our citizens to develop a counterbalancing vaccine to a mutated virus that may come from a foreign country. You said Russia is the other country, is that what you said? When, when the smallpox uh, was eradicated, there were two countries that had a deposit of smallpox virus. And that USSR at that time and the United States. No, I'm going to yield just for a second. Sure, good. We, we have testimony before our committee by Mr. Alabak for one, who said that North Korea, uh, in his judgment, has it and was experimenting with it. 
uh, and there is no certainty that other uh, um, institutes and so on that might have had the virus uh, 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 destroyed theirs and just left it with the United States and Russia. So we, we have some real uncertainties here. We have some uncertainties, and we have uh, we do not have conclusive proof that that North Korea or Iraq has it. We we think that there's a better 50-50 chance that they do. Okay, I, I'm going to uh, I, I thank the chair. I thank. Uh, uh, Governor, I just want to say this might be something we might want to get into f further discussions about since uh, I would like to go into a closed session if you want to get more discussion. Sure, and, and it, 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 since we're meeting with Russia and talking about uh, a new era of relationship with Russia, this might be a good time to take some major steps here. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Lantos, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me commend you for a very fine testimony, Mr. Secretary. And um, let me sort of put my questions and comments in some kind of perspective. This country has never been more united and more determined, and there is no doubt in my mind that we shall prevail. We have the capability intellectually and the resources materially to prevail. And the question we are debating is how we go about it. Now, in a $10 trillion economy, which is what we have, no one could argue that we do not have the resources to provide the American people, all of them, the maximum possible safety against all hazards, whether it's bioterrorism, whether it's any other type. Yet, I find that the people in the public health field are extremely critical of the budget proposed by the administration. Today's Washington Post has a story. I presume there are similar stories across the country. And let me ask you to react to some of the issues that your critics have raised. Mm -hmm. um, the administration's proposal says the executive director of the American Public Health Association in this field of fighting bioterrorism is not adequate. You are proposing $300 million. The executive director of the American Public Health Association says he needs a billion dollars. A an Ohio healthcare consultant, public health officer, says antibiotics and vaccine without staff and basic infrastructure is like putting band-aids on a huge wound. You can't just rent some people and drop them into a department that doesn't have the training or technology to handle a biological or chemical attack. The dean of the public health school at Columbia University says, there is a whole bunch of things we need and the $300 million doesn't begin to do all of these things. Now at a time when every single poll and every fiber of our common sense indicates that safety and security is at the top of the agenda of the American people, mm -hmm. how do you respond to these charges coming from people who have no personal interest in seeing these budgets doubled or tripled or, or quadrupled. These are people operating in the nonprofit sector, like Columbia University's School of Public Health. Serious people who have spent a lifetime studying these issues, and they say that the administration's approach is woefully inadequate. I would say that uh, to those individuals, some of which uh, were in the previous administration. Uh, what does that mean, Mr. Secretary? Does that mean that a professional, a physician who was in the previous administration no, was, has his credentials per, to be no, questioned? No, no, I'm just saying that the person that you first quoted was an individual that was in the previous administration. And uh, I don't believe that in the previous administration there was enough investment in the public health system. And I'm not being critical, I'm just stating a fact. I think that uh, a lot of people, including those that you mentioned, including people in this department, recognize 
the importance of strengthening the local and state public health system. I think you agree, and I agree with you, that we have some holes, some weaknesses. Our local and state public health system has been stressed, and it's been stretched right now. And what we need to do is invest in it. And the $300 million is the first giant step forward. Now, I am still uh, working $300 million, well, Mr. Well, Secretary, is a dollar ten per person in this country per year. I, That's what it is. I, I do not want to argue with you because I think you and I are on the same, same page. I think we both realize that we need to put more resources into our state and public health system. The $300 million is a giant step forward to where we have been. Does this mean that this is going to cure all evils? Absolutely not. Does this mean that we are going to have to invest more in the future? Absolutely. If we want a strong, coordinated local and state public health system, we're going to have to invest in it. And as I've said yesterday to the same group that's criticizing me and that you quoted today, and I said yesterday to those individuals, there is a consequence. There's some good that came out of the terrorist attack on September 11th. And, this, and, the, and the good consequence of what came out of that is I think we now recognize the importance and the need to invest in our local and state public health system. This is a, a huge step forward. Is it enough in the future? No. Is it enough for this particular year? I think it's, uh, it's adequate. And I think that's uh, what is important for this committee to know. It is much more than we've had in the past. Do we need more in the future? Absolutely. Well, the, the reference to the future is some, somewhat intriguing in view of the earlier testimony that we really don't know when the next terrorist attack comes. We don't have unlimited time to prepare for it. And what your critics are saying, Mr. Secretary, with all due respect, is that the future is now, that this is not a leisurely period in American history. September 11 put an end to the age of frivolity, and the age of seriousness is now with us. It is. The age of maturity is now with us. And this, this uh, gradual approach, which clearly reflects uh, the way this budget was put together, your critics say is not responsive to the crisis the American people face. Well, I think that uh, my critics are, uh, are uh, being too harsh. Uh, this is a, a huge step forward, and we are investing money in the places that they would like us to invest, maybe not as much as they would like. And I am continuing to work with Senators Kennedy and Frist, and hopefully with you, Congressman Lantos, to maybe increase that. But that is something that Congress is going to have to make a determination. Right now, this is the administration's proposal. And I am fairly comfortable that if you increase that in these areas, I'm certainly the president would strongly endorse it. Uh, Mr. Secretary, could I just ask you a, a, an economic question? Sure. An increase of $300 million, which amounts to a dollar ten per person per year, mm -hmm. can that be viewed as a serious way of addressing a woefully inadequate public health capability in responding to bioterrorism. It's not only the 300 million that the administration is asking for, it's asking for an additional 1.6 billion dollars against uh, our, our, for our fight against bioterrorism. So it's just not the 300 million. The 300 million is just that portion dealing with the local and state health uh, that's uh, right. Awareness. But the total package is 1.6, which is a lot of money, and it's a lot more than uh, we've had in the past. Uh, could we use more? Absolutely. But is this a, a tremendous legitimate step forward? Absolutely. Well, let me just say, if I still have time, Mr. Chairman. About one minute, Mr. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that this horrendous and monstrous event yes. on September 11 did to the American economy. It dramatically increased the cost of doing business, mm -hmm. just ordinary business. The airlines are putting in new cockpit uh, um, uh, doors. Absolutely. The costs across the whole transportation system will be astronomical. 
we have to adjust ourselves psychologically to being willing to pay for these things just as during two generations of the Cold War, the American people were prepared to pay for security. Now we will have to learn to pay for domestic security, and public health is the front line of domestic security. And I very much hope that you and the President will be open to significantly increasing these proposed amounts. Congressman, I would just like to point out that this President and me personally are passionate about strengthening the local and state public health system. I flew down to Atlanta to give that message yesterday to uh, several thousand public health workers. And I, want, I ask them for their cooperation and uh, their input in order to improve it and to make it better. And I applaud you for suggesting that we do that. And uh, hopefully we will be able to come up with a bipartisan package that's going to continue to move forward to improve the quality and the ability to give public health uh, services to every American. Well, you have my full commitment, as does the President, to improve the public health capabilities of this country. And you have my dedication, my passion to do so, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Thompson. We have um, heard considerable testimony on, on this topic over the, the course of a number of hearings. And uh, you know, to, to paraphrase uh, Churchill, we may have a, a woefully inadequate public health system, but I'll take ours over all the rest. Uh, I have uh, tremendous confidence in your abilities and in, 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 in the administration's commitment uh, to combating biological terrorism. All of us are, are learning a lot as we go along. We have had some hints in the past and we have made some preparations, but obviously we, we have much more to do. Uh, when, and I have every, every reason to believe that when you and your very qualified, very professional, very dedicated team of, of scientists and researchers come up with the magic number per capita that would keep us all safe and give us the maximum possible safety from all hazards, that you will share that with us. But in the meantime, I would like to, uh, to follow up on some of the proposals that, that you have outlined. You mentioned uh, your desire to put one state epidemiologist right. to, to fund them in every, in every capital. How many states have the epidemiologists with the credentials that, that you believe? 35. 35 of the 50. So we're well on our way to, to meeting that goal uh, of, of having one in every, in every state. On, on the health alert network, in this age of, of rapid communication and, and instant connectability, what are the barriers to having a email system or rapid notification system, not just to every county health department, but to every hospital and clinic in the nation that on a moment's notice, a, a message could go from Atlanta or from Washington and, and make these hospitals aware? What are the barriers to us having that now? Uh, the resources uh, in order to make the connections and the equipment in the hospitals and clinics uh, to receive that. Uh, it's uh, certainly a, a giant step forward. We have approximately 68 percent of the counties connected right now, and uh, we need to increase that uh, considerably, and we need to make sure that the uh, resources are available to hook up hospitals and clinics and local health departments with CDC. We have ways to, in order to get the information out right now but it would be nice to be able to be hooked up on the health alert network. So it is a it is a separate network. Yes, it is. But to get critical information to hospitals and clinics, surely there is a database of email addresses that, with several keystrokes, you could get critical information. Oh, across absolutely. The we have we have dial-up communication. We have fax fax, and we have emails and and everything like this going in there. Uh, but the health alert network is not connected to every hospital or health uh, or to every county. And uh, if you want, the, if you want the, the best system, that would be the best uh, for CDC in order to commute quickly and correctly uh, to every health officer in America. Mr. Kucinich raised some, some important points about laboratory security, and I know that yes. the CDC and NIH have, have taken steps. Are there other private sector or academic institutions 
that have access to pathogens uh, yes. or biological uh, no. weapon, weapon potentials uh, that, that need to beef up security and what's being done to address those particular I don't stockpiles. know about the latter part, but they do have, uh, they have pathogens and they have uh, some bacteria in the state laboratories. And uh, we had requested some legislation um, uh, for, for this department, for our department. It's moving through the House today to give our department more authority to regulate the private labs, and, which contain many biological agents that could be mobilized um, besides smallpox. And uh, we are looking for that legislation to pass. We, we know it's got bipartisan support, and hopefully that it will. But absent that legislation, so the, the status quo is that... We do not have the power. We can encourage them to do so and to beef up their security and they've been willing to do so, but we don't, have the, we don't have the authority to go in and direct them to do so, Congressman. Do you license those facilities or have any kind of a certification, any kind of regulatory oversight at all? No, we don't. That's, that is troubling. I look forward to working with you on that legislation. No, certification. The, no, the, go ahead, Tony. Um, not with regard to the security that you referred to, uh, Mr. Putnam, but what has happened over the past several years is that Prior to 1996, when it was relatively easy for uh, academic institutions to get material that might ultimately be utilized in a way, if it was used nefariously, to have uh, a bioterrorism potential, now is very strictly regulated as a select agent. So I'm not addressing your question of security once the microbe is in an academic center. But over the last several years, it has become ex much, much more difficult for someone to get an access to a microbe without having a, a, a strict uh, uh, connection regulation with the CDC. In other words, there are select agents now that are falling into that category that you can't just call up and get somebody to send something to you. We, have, we've heard yeah, testimony yeah, yeah. where people have taken their handy-dandy computer right. and printed up a letterhead right. on Acme Laboratories and sent off for microbes, and you're telling me that 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 right now that would that would not be allowable under a law that was passed, and it was it was stimulated by someone who tried to get a an agent from the American Type Culture Collection, and that now since 19 I believe 1996 is that right, Scott? Uh, Correct. Yeah, about that time. yeah, about 1996. But that doesn't address your question, which the secretary just mentioned is something that we need to improve on. Is right. there some kind of information sharing so that local health departments and local first responders are aware that in the facility in their backyard those microbes are, are in that community? I, I can't answer that question from my vantage point. I mean, as a, as a yeah. farmer, I have to let the fire department know when I buy fertilizer right. as part of the community right to know law. And I know that that applies to toxic chemicals. I don't think it applies to microbes. Is there a similar law that applies to microbes or, or other pathogens? No. no. That information is not automatically shared with health authorities. It is shared with law enforcement authorities who have connections at the local level. We, we've heard testimony of, uh, from Mr. Alabeck, who's become world famous now for his work in, in anthrax research as part of the Soviet Union's biological weapons program. And I think everyone's taken great interest in some of the horrifying things that he shared with us. In his testimony last week, he outlined a strategy for broad spectrum treatment and prophylaxis with less emphasis on vaccinations. The purpose of this hearing is obviously to, to talk about vaccines, which predominantly address the issues of anthrax and smallpox. But if you follow the, the method of operation from these terrorists who switch on a dime from embassy bombings to using commercial aircraft to blowing up ships in port to, uh, to using anthrax, we have, I think, a reasonable expectation that the anthrax will pass soon and there will be a very different threat. So to, to broaden this a little bit, uh, in addition to stockpiling the, the, the vaccine for smallpox, what are we doing from a broad spectrum perspective akin to what Mr. Lantos was saying to improve our public health surveillance, to improve our the education of, of all of our health workers and, and what are we doing on a, on a broader level beyond just the disease of the day? 
Let me mention a few things and then turn to Tony Fauci on to round up some of the research agenda, looking over the horizon. What we've been doing for the past three years is begin to build public health infrastructure around the issues of disease surveillance, laboratory capacity, training, both for clinical recognition, but for laboratory recognition at the state and local level. This has been in effect well before the event of September 11th and has been accelerated to a great extent since that time. What this allows local practitioners to do both in the public health community and the medical community is to have early recognition either through training, seminars, uh, collaborations with guilds like the American Hospital Association, the AMA, the American Public Health Association, and those kinds of forums, as well as combined Department of Defense, HHS educational programming for clinical disease recognition to get beyond that disease of the day kind of thing. It has included a wide range of critical agents for public health awareness and continues to uh, accentuate those things that are critical at understanding at the state and local level, level for disease detection and control. With that, let me turn to Tony Fauci a little more about the research on the horizon. Mr. Putnam, what, what Alabeck was referring to specifically with regard to the medical approach of a highly specific approach like a smallpox vaccine, an anthrax vaccine, or an anthrax drug was referring to what we call the innate or somewhat nonspecific immune system. And he was referring to research on inducing a component of the immune system that only over the last few years has come under intensive study. We refer to it as the innate immune system. And it's innate because it has the capability of being a first responder. It's an evolutionary component of when mankind evolved to protect themselves against different types of infections. The first line of defense is the innate immune system. So it has a much broader nonspecific capability of attacking a microbe. So the point he was making is that if you put your money with smallpox vaccine, this vaccine, that vaccine, while you're doing that, he doesn't say don't do that, and we totally agree with that, that you should be pushing for something that's more broad. And that gets under the category of what the secretary was referring to as the basic research as well as the applied and the research that you can use, for example, with a vaccine. There is considerable amount of that research going on at the NIH, specifically in my institute, which is the institute that studies the immune system and infections. And it is that interface between the immune system and infection that I believe over the next several years will lead us to have a more comprehensive approach towards microbes. But that's not something that's going to address a question tomorrow or next month, but it's the research that's going to give us a greater capability five, six, seven, eight years from now. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci and, and Secretary Thompson. You and your people are, are very much on the front lines of this new war and uh, are, are, are patriots for that and probably under-recognized for the, for the tremendous responsibility that you bear, and we appreciate what you're doing. Thank, thank you, you gentlemen. Mr. Sanders. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your important and informative remarks. Uh, this is a serious crisis, and you are attempting to deal with it seriously. And uh, we're just going to have to work together and share the ideas that we have as best we can. Um, I am especially delighted in response to Mr. Lantos, your strong <coughs> commitment to significantly improve our public health system. Uh, I have always believed that it is a national disgrace that as the richest country on earth, 44 million Americans have no health insurance and many more are inadequately insured. But given a health care crisis as a result of a terrorist attack, I remain concerned that there will be many, many millions of Americans who will not know where to turn, that there will not be health care facilities in their community that they can access. Now, during the campaign, uh, President Bush, candidate Bush then, talked about federally qualified health centers, which seemed to me to be an extraordinarily cost-effective mechanism not only to provide health care to all Americans, but to deal with this crisis. I come from a rural state, and there are people who live 100 miles away from a hospital. They may not know who their doctor is. It would be of real value to people all over this country to know that there is at least one health care one healthcare clinic in their area that they can walk into regardless of their income 
and get care during an emergency, get the medicine they need, et cetera. I would hope that in the midst of this crisis, we raise again the issue of federally qualified health clinics, and we adequately fund them, and we set them up in every county in the United States. Second of all, let me reiterate my concern about the power of the drug companies. It is no secret, I think as you may well know, that the pharmaceutical industry is the most powerful lobby on Washington. They always win, which means we end up paying the highest prices uh, in the world. Now, I understand that Bayer has indicated to you that it will take 20 months to produce all the Cipro that you have requested. Yet the FDA has tentatively approved five generic manufacturers to make Cipro, and they have indicated that it would take three months to produce the same amount. And I wonder if, in, in a moment, you can comment on that, why we would not go with, with five companies who could produce what we need in three months rather than uh, bear in 20 months. The last question that I wanted to ask is the following. I think, as we have all indicated, nobody here is happy about raising nightmarish situations, but it is important that we do, that we get it out on the table and we do our best to be able to respond. Let me throw a nightmare at you. Uh, I am concerned, and, and I would like, uh, I hope that the people can tell me that my concerns are, are not justified. I fear very much the possibility that on some windy Saturday morning, a half a dozen small Cessnas will take off in different locations in this country, each with a couple of hundred pounds of anthrax, and that simultaneously they will be released. And if that is the case, it would mean, given the weather and the temperature and the wind, that tens of millions of people could be exposed to anthrax. Now, my question is, go through that scenario and tell us our capabilities of responding for a start, as I understand it. The good news is that if we know we are exposed to anthrax, we can treat it with antibiotics. That's very important and very good. How will we, will you, not you, will the United States government, while local public health authorities be able to tell the American people before they develop the symptoms, guess what, we've got a crisis, get to the hospital, get your medicine right away. Do we have that capability to detect anthrax in the air? Do we have, you asked for 12 million doses, as, as I understand for Cipro. Maybe you could tell us why 12 million and not 100 million and so forth and so on. But I fear, I mean, I, I appreciate that's a nightmarish situation, mm -hmm. but all over this country, every health resource strain to the utmost degree. Uh, can we and are we moving to try to deal with that scenario, understanding that the good news is, if we have our act together, that we can perhaps minimize the, the death and suffering that might take place, because, as you have indicated, anthrax is treatable if we get to it soon enough. So those are my, I wanted a specific response, if you could, about Bayer in 20 months as opposed to the other companies, federally qualified health clinics, and this nightmarish scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Congressman Sanders. Let me, let me try and go through uh, many of the things you said, and then uh, uh, Scott Lillibridge will want to respond, and I sure Tony Falci will as well. Um, to your nightmarish uh, thing that hopefully will not happen. Uh, first off, in regards uh, to uh, community health centers and federally qualified centers, uh, as you know, the president put in uh, in his proposal uh, enough money to increase that from 2,200 to 3,400, an additional 1,200, and go from 11 million people to 20 million. In regards to every county, uh, I am not opposed to that, and uh, as you can probably recognize, I think, that that is a, a way to deliver good quality health care in America. And also coming from a rural area, I know the importance of community health centers and federal qualified health centers. So I recognize that and uh, whether or not the, the resources are there, whether or not Congress is, is going to pass it, I don't know. But, but you recognize this is a very cost-effective way to provide quality it is one care. Of the, it's one of the best and, uh, and I think it is uh, and I think they get very good quality health care there. I've spoken to uh, and been involved in raising money for them personally and have been very much involved in them. It's a very cost-effective way to... And they could play a role if, God forbid, we And they could. Them. Secondly, I, I want to point out that 
once again you know how do we recognize how do we notify people what we do is we have seven thousand medical professionals throughout the united states divided into ninety teams that we would move very quickly we have cdc sending out epidemiologists and we would have nih we also have our commission corps if it was a vast thing and we would be able to to call those people up within hours yes mr secretary here was my question and i don't can one detect anthrax in the air before one develops a symptom? In other words, the, the, no. the problem would be that if it no. takes you three days, by the time you get the symptom, you've got a problem. We haven't been able to determine that. Are yet. we working on trying to develop yes, a yes, mechanism? Yes, we are, but we haven't found it yet. But uh, the third thing is, is that in regards to uh, Bayer, which you were concerned yes. about, I'm not here to defend Bayer. I'm here to tell you that I'm negotiating with them. And once the negotiations are done, I would like to sit down and show you what we are. They have indicated to me that uh, they can provide uh, 200 million pills within 90 days, and they can adequately ramp up and produce it within weeks, whatever we need. But the price is the question, not the supply. And that is something that we're going to be negotiating and debating. And uh, I can assure you that we are not going to pay the price that they asked. Let me ask, am I incorrect in saying that they have told you that it would take them 20, 20 months to produce all the Cipro you have requested? Am I correct I think, in that? I think, or I think you're wrong because they told me they could produce 200 million pills within the next 60 days. All right, and if you are unhappy with their performance, either in terms of speed of delivery or in price, are you prepared to go to generic companies I am prepared to ask Congress for that authority. Okay, you know the Canadians have done that? I know, but I know that we have a different law than the Canadians. Okay, but you are prepared if Bayer does not cooperate with you to do that? Yes, I am. Okay. And okay. now the third thing in regards to your nightmare thing, let's hope it doesn't happen. Right. But I think uh, Scott Lillibridge is better able to do that. Sir, let me make a few comments. First, as we've gone to this new kind of war, uh, we've developed a game plan. We've developed this game plan as we've refined it over the past couple weeks. And let me just tell you what's emerging in this. While we had a basic uh, public health commitment to build infrastructure in certain areas, we've been out on that for the past three years. We've also been readying our clinical response. Let me tell you some of the key elements of this game plan. They're clearly prevention, and we are networking with the intelligence community to try to interdict, understand, get early warning about such events. And uh, we do that on a daily basis. You this get early warning in other ways than somebody, you're suddenly seeing a rash of illness in a given community and say, we've got a problem. Can you get early warning in, in other ways before that? You can. You can get early warning in terms of helping you gauge your likelihood of a, a one, prioritize your efforts in one pathogen versus another. You can get early warning in terms of where to put your resources, and you can get early warning to put your detection out and look in certain areas. We are working with the uh, intelligence, law enforcement communities on a daily basis and coordinating in a way we haven't done before. Second part of the game plan is clearly detection, early detection, and uh, that involves clinical awareness, picking up cases, uh, sentinel networks for surveillance, laboratory kinds of information. Third area of the control is disease control, and that involves the steps to corral and contain the disease, keep it from spreading in the population, interdicting steps like prophylaxis. Would you agree with the Secretary that it, at this point there is no way of doing air detection and knowing if there's something in the air? Sir, currently my understanding is that real-time technology to detect aerosol salt is really not available. Is that something we're working on? It is something multiple agencies and departments are working on in a collective fashion. Um, what I can address, sir, is the, uh, is the research component of it, uh, what we can do in the future uh, for having uh, uh, capabilities of detecting. There are obviously molecular means that are research tools right now. Can you detect a microbe by having what we call a microchip that might be able to determine uh, if, you, if there's a certain concentration in the atmosphere. That's in the research phase right now that is not going to help tomorrow or the next day. Uh, from the standpoint of research related to better ways of addressing anthrax, I think it's important to bring out, because Scott mentioned the public health components of it very well, and I can't add to that, is that 
the research that's going on right now is trying to address much more specific ways to combat the anthrax microbe over and above the question of antibiotics. In fact, today, this afternoon, there will be a press conference downtown by the journal Nature talking about some very exciting new research about really being able to specifically block the toxins of anthrax. And I think that's something that we should pay attention to because we're going to try and translate that and from the fundamental basic research to something that we can try in humans very rapidly. One I final think my time has yeah. run out. Is that right, Mr. Yes, Chairman? thank yeah. you. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, Secretary, um, uh, this is probably the only time you'll appear before our committee this term. And if you don't mind, we'd like to do one last pass and, uh, and then uh, Absolutely. you can walk across the hall to your office. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> We've heard from uh, the media, the public, government as they interact throughout this. Uh, Excuse uh, me, can I, can I just interrupt? Mr. Secretary. Uh, Senators Kennedy and Frist are over here to meet with Dr. Falci. And do you mind if uh, we, do you have another question for Dr. Falci? Well, I, I, t I will tell you this, that I, I do want to get into the, the um, whole issue of, of new vaccines and uh, you know, to what extent do we push FDA and so on? Um, but I'm not inclined to have you keep senators waiting. Um, so um, we'll just try to wrestle through without the, uh, Dr. Falci here. I will have, I got somebody from FDA here. Okay, I'll need to swear them in, but if okay. that's okay, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Would you let the senators know we were eager to have you meet with them? Yes, I will. I will, I will convey that message. Uh, uh, and, and tell them that we've missed them. Could I, could I ask you to stand and just identify yourself? Uh, Dr. William Egan, Deputy Director, Office of Vaccines at Thank FDA. You. Thank you. If you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give to the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Nice to have your participation. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman can start over. I, I thank uh, the chair. Uh, what do we have? Ten? Okay. I thank the chair. In the last few weeks, we've uh, seen from government, the media, the public, people are experiencing and articulating some of their deepest fears. Yes, they are. And, and for that reason, it's a very challenging time in the life of our nation. Um, and with many people, when you start to experience your deepest fears, you go into a survival mode. And I would just like to suggest that uh, uh, such a condition, uh, which has its analog in science in, a, in terms of a general stimulus response, is not necessarily conducive to maintaining a democracy. Uh, and that is that, well, we need to meet these challenges as they arise and try to pre prevent them the best we can. Uh, we need to take great care that as we explore these various public health challenges that could come up, that we do not create hysteria or induce a panic among the American people. Because panic is not a good place from which to make decisions. That's true. Uh, now, there, I think we're starting to redefine what, what are public health issues here. Now, there, I think we're starting to redefine what, what are public health issues here. I mean, I'm certain the Secretary has uh, come up with some new definitions of public health since uh, September 11th. And one of the things that occurs to me it, with this dialogue we had a few moments ago about uh, biological weapons that may come, that may be present on our own shores with the government, with the private sector in some way, that um, for the first time, the Biological Weapons Treaty becomes a public health issue. Because if we can find a way to start to control uh, biological and chemical weapons, uh, it's 
quite possible that such weapons will not be used against mass publics, therefore occasioning the kind of concerns which HHS is uh, very busy about these days. So I, I wanted to share that uh, view with you, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, because I, I know that, uh, you know, based on, on your interview with 60 Minutes, that, and based on your experience as a governor, uh, you try to maintain a confident outlook. You try to communicate to the public that we're going to do everything we can to protect them. You're also aware of all the different variables. That's right. And, and I think that you're trying to do the best job you can, and I, I respect that, and I appreciate your service. Now, one of the things that we need to look at, I believe, uh, is to focus resources more and more on the national medical response system, which is intended, as you know, to help every city, locality, or metropolitan area design a disaster plan for public health emergencies. Now, it's operated uh, through contracts awarded through HHS, um, and FEMA has estimated that it would cost approximately two and a half million per city to develop and coordinate these plans. And, and actually, those kind of plans make sense. Uh, it, it gets people working together in the, in the event of any contingency. So there is a sense through that work, people gain a sense of security that we're, we're ready, we're prepared, and then they can go about their, their life a little bit easier. Now, currently, according to my information, HHS has been giving about 600000 each city. And your new proposal provides only $50 million more for local and state plans. And, uh, and according to my calculations, this would be enough to only bring about 25 cities up to the minimum level recommended by FEMA. And, it, of course, there are more than 25 cities that need full funding for public health emergencies. Uh, what can you do as uh, the secretary to help local communities get the resources to prepare for public health emergencies and, and begin the process of trying to bring some peace of mind to communities that at least they're working to deal with uh, eventualities, uh, whether or not they, in fact, ever materialize? Several things. Uh, first, uh, I uh, can use the bully pulpit of uh, my office. Uh, secondly, uh, we are expanding it from 97 to 122 cities, as you've indicated, 25. Uh, it's important. I think that uh, stretches us to about, uh, with everything else going on, I think that's about as much as we can handle in this particular year, uh, Congressman. Uh, it would be nice if we could do more, but uh, we want to do what we do. We want to do correctly and be able to develop the best systems, the best plans. Uh, number three, I am trying to uh, uh, be confident in outlook because I think it's very important for the American people to know that we we are not going to allow the terrorists uh, to defeat us through terror. Uh, we've heard the bio, but the second part of that, the terror, is what you talked about, and it's important. Fourth, we do need uh, the supplemental plan approved by Congress. It's important for us to get this extra dollars into the local and state public health systems. And uh, if Congressman Lantos is successful in getting more, we will be able to put that uh, to good use. And uh, I think it is important for all of us to realize that this is a bipartisan thing. I think that in the past, I don't think we've invested in our public health system very adequately. And I think we've actually disinvested. And I think that it's important for us to realize that and now move forward on a bipartisan basis to strengthen and coordinate our local and state public health systems, develop disaster plans, develop educations, put epidemiologists in our health departments wherever we possibly can, expand our health alert network, and be able to get that kind of education and information to our local health departments, our hospitals, as well as educating our emergency ward people, our doctors and nurses, how to diagnose and how to look at things because they have, they've been trained in medical school, but uh, since they've never seen anthrax poisoning, they, they probably could miss it. So we important for us to do all of these things in a cooperative and collaborative fashion through the Department of Health and Human Services, NIH and CDC, and with Congress. Well, I'm glad to see the Secretary articulating this broader vision of involvement of HHS working cooperatively with government at all levels to try to make sure that our public health institutions will be up to uh, the challenge, not only the challenge that we find as a result of the events of September 11th, Mr. Secretary. Right. Uh, you know, there are 
Mr. Sanders alluded to it earlier, there are 43 million Americans right now who don't have adequate health coverage. Um, it, it may be with insurance companies bringing a parade uh, to Congress looking for bailouts of, our, of their very industry, which is supposed to be about risk, that, that we may find uh, your department achieving a larger and larger role in the functioning of public health in this country, even beyond what you do. Now, I, I want to... Um, I never expected when I came out here is to become an expert in embryonic stem cells and bioterrorism, so I would like to get back to, back to public health. And, and I never expected to have to leave the Capitol under an anthrax scare, and I'll tell you, we'll never do it again. Uh, now, in, I, 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 I want to conclude with this... Um, uh, discussion again that Mr. Sanders had started. Um, and this is about th this generic manufacturer of Cipro. Mm -hmm. Now, it's possible since you have five generic companies that have already tentatively uh, been approved to manufacture Cipro, and it's legal because the government has, as you know, both the authority and the precedent to act under the uh, TRIPS agreement, Article 73 Security Exceptions Clause, quote, nothing construed to prevent a member from taking any action uh, which it considers necessary for the protection of its essential national security interest uh, taken in time of war or other emergency in international relations. So we have uh, a legal precedent there. We also have 28 U.S.C. Section 1498, which allows the government to purchase products for official use from alternative sources with payment to a patent holder of a royalty fee to be determined by a judge. And I might say, as Mr. Sanders has repeatedly stressed, it's cheaper well, the U.S. government uh, purchase price is nearly $2 per pill. Generic versions are $0.20 cents or less per pill. That means with, a, with $643 million of the $1.5 billion HHS requested, the U.S. could buy enough generic doses to treat 31.5 million people instead of merely 2.6 million people uh, if we were paying top dollar. So, you know, these are considerations I'm sure that you're going into because you want to make sure that you can uh, if, if we need to deal with this or to have it stockpiled, at least to uh, have the ability to respond to help more and more people. And um, I'm, I'm confident, Mr. Secretary, Thank that th these are things you're considering. Am I? You're absolutely correct. And do you feel that you, you'll be able to look at trying to lower the cost to the government for these? You don't know me that well, but uh, I negotiate very tough and I, will. I'll accept that. Okay. Thank you. I just, uh, again, want to thank the Secretary for um, participating here. We have uh, uh, allocated 10 minutes to each of the members for the remaining time. We've been joined by Mr. Tierney as well. Uh, I just would say to the members that they don't need to use the 10 minutes. We do have three other panels that will follow. Uh, but uh, at this time, we're going to go to Mr. Lantos, then we're going to go to uh, um, uh, my colleague, uh, the ranking member, then to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Tierney, and then I'll finish up. Chairman, I like to ask unanimous consent to place in the record a brilliant article on German bank security which appeared in today's New York letter. Times. I'd like to raise some questions. What, what, what day did that? Today's. 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 Um, the president elect of the American Society of Microbiology estimates that there are about 250 scientific centers in the United States that have anthrax stocks and about a thousand sites abroad. And uh, clearly security at many, if not most of these, is singularly inadequate. And obviously determined terrorists are fully capable of um, obtaining anthrax at all of these facilities. As a matter of fact, they don't even have to be terrorists engaging in criminal acts. Let me remind uh, all of us that a fellow by the name of Larry Harris, with a history of affiliations with hate groups, managed to buy plague bacteria from an American germ bank by mail paying $100 each for three vials. And after he was caught, Congress rewrote the nation's terrorism laws and tightened germ security. 
imposing tough rules on their acquisition and transfer. But we have very little, we have had very little success in having overseas facilities follow the procedures that need to be followed in this country. I would be grateful if the Secretary or either of your colleagues would comment on what steps we are taking to see to it that globally this does not happen in the future. We haven't, uh, we haven't done enough, uh, Congressman, but I will, I'm going to defer the, the answer to the question to Scott Lillibridge. Thanks. Uh, sir, there's a number of things that we're doing. We have ongoing collaborations internationally with groups like the World Health Organization that include issues like laboratory safety, training, global surveillance, and other things that could provide early detection. It falls short of interdiction in terms of legal ability to um, detain, acquire, but there is a growing international movement. Uh, the WHO director was at CDC just yesterday. And there is growing concern in international circles, both in ministries of health, which have been contacting us, as well as WHO, that, that bioterrorism preparedness needs to be a regular part of Ministry of Health activity, and that needs to be a substantial component of the infectious disease control efforts of WHO. We're going to participate in those efforts. Now, I realize, Mr. Secretary, this, this is not in your bailiwick, but in Colin Powell's bailiwick. But I would like to ask you to join me in discussing with Secretary Powell that we direct all of our ambassadors in every country where we have diplomatic relations that this issue be raised with the appropriate authorities at the highest levels. Because you can have the most incredible security here in this country if this security is not present elsewhere, we will face the problem and I would be grateful for your help and cooperation on this. It's a very valid suggestion, and I would enjoy that uh, joining with you in that discussion. I think it's a discussion that should be taken, Congressman. Thank you very much. And before I yield my time, let me just say, Mr. Secretary, you have done an outstanding job here, and we all appreciate your commitment to this issue. Thank you very much, Congressman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Um, we'll go to Mr. Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to... Uh, to change gears just slightly. As part of your request for the supplemental, you had asked for 410 new FDA inspectors to deal with food safety issues. Would that be at the retail level only, the finished product, grocery store level? What is being done to coordinate with USDA to deal with agroterrorism and bulk goods? We are um, we're coordinating very effectively with uh, agriculture. But the problem we have, Congressman, is that we have 750 agents in FDA. We have 56,000, 56,000 establishments that we're supposed to inspect. And we are inspecting them, uh, we're supposed to inspect them once a year. And those that have not caused problems, we inspect maybe once every four years, once every five years. There are 132 ports of entry into the United States that food is imported into the United States. And we, at the present time, only have 150 agents that are inspecting the food that comes in from 132 different ports. We are not even scratching the surface as far as, as monitor and inspecting foods. The 410, 200 goes to the border and goes to airports to buttress the 150, so we would have 350. The other 100 would go into our laboratories to give the background checks and to be able to improve what we have as our OASIS system. And 100, uh, the other remaining 100, would go to help improve the inspections on the 56,000 sites. So FDA has not, FDA is like the public health system. It has not been able to get the resources in food inspection like we have not invested in our public health system in America. Well, you have, you have APHIS under USDA at the ports looking for invasive exotic that, pests, plants, and diseases. That is correct. How do you link up, how does FDA overlap with that uh, if it is a bulk container of a perishable fruit or vegetable, is that USDA? But if it's meat, is it FDA? Where, where are the jurisdictional lines there? 
They're pretty cloudy, and uh, there's really no rational, uh, rational uh, reason for it. Uh, agriculture is supposed to inspect the beef and, and poultry, and we are supposed to in inspect the manufactured yields. But in the case of eggs, we inspect the raw eggs, and they inspect the manufactured eggs, which makes no sense whatsoever. And there needs to be further cooperation and collaboration with the Department of Agriculture. And uh, I think that we're working in that regard, but am I satisfied? No. Am I satisfied with the inspection we're doing? No. Uh, is this going to help? Tremendously. And we have to do a much better job. I am more fearful about this than anything else. Well, I am too, and I have been talking about this in a variety of committees on the ag side and on this side and, and even in the legislature trying to beef up our airport and seaport inspection teams. But, but FDA only deals with a finished processed food product. Is that an accurate that's statement? That's mm -hmm. So all of the raw goods coming in, including meat, is USDA's responsibility, not yours. That is correct. And they, I but have they the same have, inadequate system as you. I mean, I'm here. You're, you're not. But by yourself agriculture in that is, I believe, is down to nine ports. We have 132 ports of entry. Food only comes in. Uh, I don't understand the, agri the agriculture. Your the, por the ports that agriculture comes in, I think, are down to nine. I don't know. <laughs> that, that sounds a little low. Yeah, but I think that's only, I think it's the only nine that they come in. That that is an area of of, of great concern. Uh, we have highlighted, you know, in in the in the frivolous as we've heard earlier in the frivolous pre September the 11th days, we were dealing with things like hoof and mouth disease, right. which would have a huge impact on, on food safety and consumer confidence in in the level of of quality of and healthfulness of our food supply. Well, gentlemen, you have a sec. Oh, just given that you have staff here, if they could confirm it so we could put it on the record as to how many points of uh, okay, points I will, I'll, I'll get that for you before we adjourn. Before the secretary leaves, if someone could uh, find that out, get that from uh, from uh, FDA and, and also get it uh, from agriculture. So we have these other things that were out there prior to September the 11th that we used to think were scary. Uh, the fact that like hoof, mad cow disease, the mad cow, hoof and mouth, and all of those things can be harnessed and weaponized or, or, or contained and, and channeled into a particular direction. And we had testimony again from Mr. Alabeck that indicated that he had as many people working on agricultural terrorism, threats to the economy and livestock and, and crops as he did working on, on threats to, to humans, to, to casualties. And uh, so this is of, of great concern to me, and, and I hope that the coordination will improve between the agencies, which really we leads should, me... Go ahead. Could, you know what we should do? We should be able to, uh, to allow agriculture inspectors to be able to inspect our stuff, and we should be able to inspect agriculture. We should have cross-certification. I mean, that's a radical idea, but it seems, makes common sense to me. And instead of having two inspectors go in the same building, one inspector should be able to do it and maximize the time and efforts. And it hasn't been able to been worked out, and I hope with, with this kind of a problem, that's one positive thing that may come out of this thing. No, no question about it. The jurisdictional fights, and it's not just between FDA and USDA, because you have Fish and Wildlife, you have Customs, you have Border Patrol, and all of these things didn't have the momentum behind them to be seriously addressed by the Congress until the 11th. And I would hope that all of us will, will harness this new momentum to bring about the radical change that will be necessary to establish a safety net at our airports and seaports that, that we just haven't had in the past. There is no cross-training. There is very little communication. And even with the best of coordination, we're still only hitting a tiny fraction of the containers that are coming into these seaports. You're absolutely correct. And Congressman Putnam, I'm so happy you brought it up. Uh, this has been a concern of mine for a long time, and I'm so appreciative that people like you are concerned about it. I hope that you will take a look at our proposal dealing with food safety. It's, uh, it, it is still not enough, but it is a, a tremendous step in the right direction, and I would hope that we would be able to get it passed in this session of Congress. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, Mr. Sanders, and then Mr. Tierney will go to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, I would like you, if you would be so kind, to comment on an article that appeared in the New York Times October 18, 2001. Let me quote from parts of the article. Quote, although Bayer, a German pharmaceutical company, is tripling production of Cipro 
it will take the company 20 months, working 24 hours a day, to produce what Mr. Thompson says the government needs, enough pills to treat 12 million people for 60 days. The government currently has enough Cipro for 2 million people. Five drug companies that have received initial approval to make generic Cipro pending the expiration of Bayer's patent in 2003 say they could produce the same quantity in three months, not 20 months, three months. One official close to the administration's negotiations with Mr. Schumer said that the White House had, quote, clearly made a political decision, end of quote. White House officials did not respond to requests for comment on the issue, which is why I'm going to give you the opportunity now. Mr. Thompson acknowledged that there were other considerations. Quote, we haven't been in the process of breaking patents, end quote, he said today. Bush administration officials and other Republican administrations have long been philosophically opposed to meddling in the private marketplace. President Bush also has close ties to the pharmaceutical industry, which contributed heavily to his presidential campaign and Republican election committees. Two of the president's cabinet members are former drug company executives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So bottom line here is it seems that if we went to other companies, we might likely have more Cipro quicker and perhaps at a lower price. So I would like you to tell me and the American people why we are not moving in that direction. And also, the issue about uh, treating 12 million people for 60 days, God forbid there is a real tragedy. We may need more of that. So can you please respond to that article? I'll try, uh, I'll try and uh, respond, uh, Congressman, to your satisfaction. First off, uh, <coughs> uh, it is my understanding directly talking to the company that they can produce uh, the number of pills that we need in regards uh, to this anthrax outbreak within 60 days, not 20 months. That, that's what they have okay. told me as, as uh, recent as of last week. All right, so the New York Times said 20 months, and you believe it is two months. That is, that is what the company has, uh, has responded to me when I raised that question to them. Would you be so kind as to confirm that later on after you talk to Bear with this committee and see sure. if the New York I, Times is accurate? I'm going to be negotiating with Bear this afternoon, okay. Congressman, and I will. I, that's one of the questions that's on my itinerary that I'm going to be talking about, okay? Uh, secondly, in regards uh, uh, to the patent issue, uh, I have indicated to the Bear that they better sharpen their pencil very sharp before they come down here. And if they don't sharpen the pencil, they don't need to come. Uh, third, if I can get the same price or similar price or save the taxpayer dollars, considerable dollars, and not break the patent, I see no problem with that. Fourth, my lawyers tell me, unless Congress changes the law further, that we would have to pay damages to them if they brought a lawsuit against us. And uh, that is, I know you're smiling, but that is what I'm my... I'm not smiling. That's I, what my lawyers say, Congressman, okay. and I, I have to rely... Well, Mr. Kucinich, if I, if I may, sure. Mr. Kucinich raised this issue a moment ago. Common sense dictates and international law dictates right. that when you have a national crisis, we do not have to give enormously profitable pharmaceutical companies the price they want. That's why we're here, to protect the American people. And if they want profits rather than serving the people, I think the law is very clear that we have a right to go outside of that company. Do you disagree with that, Mr. I Secretary? do not disagree, and in fact, I agreed with you earlier. And I also told you that uh, wait till I get done negotiating, and then I'll sit down and we will discuss whether or not I made a good deal. But you are not at this point ruling out. I am not ruling out. In going fact, outside of bear and getting a generic. I answered, Mr. Uh, Congressman, Sinchi, that if in fact I couldn't, uh, if I could not reach an agreement that was advantageous to the American public, I would come and talk to this committee and to Congress and ask for more authority to do so. And knowing your passion for this, you'll be the first one I come to see and ask you to support the legislation, Congress. I, I think, Mr. Secretary, um, this is an enormously important issue. It is. In this sense also. Um, <laughs> It's not only a moral issue, but it is very clearly a health response issue. Yeah. The American people would be very disappointed if they believed that an industry which has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on campaign contributions and lobbying and all that stuff was able to prevail upon the Congress or the administration in reaching a decision 
that only work for the company and not for the American people. And, so I, agree with, and I agree with that. Could I finish my Please, ask, I, ask? Sure. There also, everybody you know is, everybody, uh, Congressman Sanders, is just concerned about Cipro. But of all the, th all the anthrax that we've tested, and I want, I want to make this crystal clear, the anthrax that's been tested, all of the anthrax that's been tested is sensitive to all the antibiotics. Ciprofloxin, penicillin, doxycycline, and several other ones that are in our thing. And those are generic drugs. And we think, you know, that since they are, can treat anthrax just as effectively as Cipro, and that's what CDC has indicated, and FDA has approved that, that we should start talking more about just Cipro, but talk about penicillin and talks about doxycycline. And some of them, in some cases, are more effective. Some, some individuals have reactions to ciprofloxin. Some mothers that are pregnant should not be taking ciprofloxin, so we put them on other antibiotics. And what we're saying is, is not only are we purchasing Cipro, we are purchasing other antibiotics, such as penicillin and doxycycline to treat anthrax. It is not only Cipro. And those are generic drugs, and those are, are going to be purchased. And I would like to leave this committee and the American public with the understanding and knowledge that they can also purchase uh, penicillin and doxycycline if they need to in order to prevent and to be able to, to uh, prevent the infection from taking place if they encounter anthrax. They should not go out and hoard it, and that's what I'm saying. Mr. Secretary, last question on, on, sure. on this subject. Um, I have heard differently than what you have just indicated, that while it is true that penicillin and other antibiotics can work effectively, that the product of choice would be Cipro. Is for that the first, not for the first five days. Okay. Okay. That is your understanding. That's correct. Okay. So if, God forbid, there was an emergency, we would turn to that particular drug, Cipro. And then the question is, how do we get that product as inexpensively? How do we produce it? You didn't also yet tell me what, what's holy about the word 12 million, 12 million people rather than more. If there was because, a it's, because it's not contagious, we felt that 12 million is an ample supply if, in fact, the nightmarish thing that you mentioned would come about. We thought that we could treat it. And that's, that was... The number, let me just ask you, that. I mean, again, this is that, such a that, God forbid scenario. I had to, and, and I, I didn't, we, we didn't pull this figure out of the air. I want you to know, Congressman, this is a, a scientific panel that reviewed this and made this recommendation to me. All right, if an aerosol was dropped on our three largest cities, yeah. you would have more than 12 million people. Wouldn't you want, wouldn't all of those people want to go... We also have the 12 million for 60 days, and we would go back into the market and purchase more during the 60 days. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Cherney, thank you for your patience. Uh, these are mics that um, you don't have to talk directly into. In fact, it's better if you don't. Better if we don't talk at all sometimes, right? <laughs> thank you. Are you old enough, Mr. Secretary? I'm doing well. Okay. Yeah, I've only got two or three questions. Uh, following up on uh, my colleague, Mr. Sanders, is on the Cipro. There are press accounts uh, that Cipro struck a deal with one of the genetic, generic uh, manufacturers and basically received millions of dollars from that generic manufacturer to not uh, go into competition on that. Uh, what are your feelings about that specifically? I also understand the FTC may be bringing action against them for antitrust violation, but what are your specific feelings about that incident, but also on a broader scale, what we ought we to do about that uh, in terms of the whole marketplace? Uh, I, uh, I really have... Uh no knowledge of that uh, of that lawsuit. I've heard about it. I have not investigated myself, Representative Tierney, and uh, I will now that you've mentioned it. But uh, I haven't had time to to delve into it. I do know that those individuals want to come and talk to me about that lawsuit, and uh, I intend to do so. But at this point in time, I do not have the background information in order for me to properly respond to your question. During the uh, first Bush administration. Uh, Mr. Bush Sr., there was a public health representative on the National Security Council, and I, my understanding is that, that uh, President Bush stopped that uh, practice. What's your recommendation with regard to that? Do you favor having a public health representative on the National Security Council? Yes. But I have not been asked. <laughs> you've, not, you've not even been asked? <laughs> uh, 
let me say we had a, an occasion over the uh, last weekend uh, to meet with most of the uh, first responders in the district, uh, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, uh, public health people, and one of the major topics that they had was communication in terms of getting the message uh, from people in the federal uh, or the state level and getting it themselves and then being able to disperse it uh, to the public so that it was consistent, uh, didn't cause confusion and didn't cause panic. Uh, what, uh, what do you propose uh, for information sharing from the CDC, from the public health people on through that will sort of uh, help that process be one that's a message of consistency that flows all the way down to the local level so that uh, people have some appreciation and feeling of security that they're getting the accurate information and that they uh, they can rely on it uh, we've attempted to uh, rectify that problem in the last 10 days i've uh, had a um, telecommunications conference uh, with uh, uh, the head of cdc jeff colpin and myself with all the state health directors on a saturday afternoon and went very well since then uh, we've had a teleconference uh, with uh, uh, the state legislative leaders, the National Governors Organization, uh, the um, American Hospital Association, and the American Medical Association. And every day in the last five days, we've been holding uh, teleconferences with the press uh, from my office, uh, with the uh, health officers and myself. And so we are reaching out, getting as much information as possible. We've also put up on the website at CDC how to handle anthrax and information uh, that uh, you need to know. We also opened up a 24-hour um, hotline uh, for anybody that wants to call in the CDC. We also have a 24-hour hot, uh, hotline going into our war room downstairs uh, on the sixth floor. So there's plenty of ways that you can get information, and we're trying to educate the American public, and we're trying to give as much information as we possibly can about public health. That's why we're reaching out with these teleconferences, these press conferences, and these hotlines, that 24-hour uh, hotlines that we set up at CDC and here at the, in the Humphrey Building. I, the feedback is that those hotlines have been extraordinarily helpful. So I want to thank you and, and your staff for that. But, but ask you, that 24 hours, seven days a week hotline, is that something you intend to continue? Uh, for the foreseeable future, I, 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 I don't know when this uh, right. terrible thing is going to But you end. have no plans of taking it down or whatever, because it has gotten a great response. People are receptive to it. And we're trying to. We're trying to do more. And we're reaching out, you know, wherever we possibly can. And, uh, other groups, now we're looking into the specialized medical groups, uh, you know, especially the emergency wards, and to be able to have a teleconference with them. A lot of those were on the American Medical Association, but and I think there were 50,000 doctors on that teleconference hookup that particular day that Jeff Colpin and I did. So we know that there's an interest out there, and we're trying to do more of that, Congressman. And if you've got any suggestions, we'll be more than happy to take them up and uh, try to implement them. Thank you very much. Yield back to balance my time. Thank you, John. We have uh, another new member, Mr. Weldon, and then I'll finish up. Uh, Dr. Weldon, <coughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've uh, tried to get a hold of you and return your call. I had Dave, uh, I had my deputy secretary call you, I know. Well, thank you for uh, trying to get back. And certainly, I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, in this arena. Um, I've been uh, listening to you and you're sounding less like a lawyer and more like a doctor uh, when I hear you on television. <laughs> uh, that may not be a compliment. <laughs> In this case, I take it as yeah, one. You should. Okay. You should. Um, and, and I just got here, uh, so uh, I apologize if I uh, cover some territory that maybe already has been covered, but um, the two postal workers that died, uh, I understand one of them uh, had been in the emergency room and had been sent out and then came back. And as I'm sure you you know, the nature of inhaled uh, uh, anthrax is it's very fulminant and, and its early hours of presentation mimics uh, flu or, or the cold. Um, I heard you mention in response to one of the questions uh, a very high level of interest amongst the medical profession. Uh, could you just briefly outline some of the things HHS is doing to educate the medical profession, particularly in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, to uh, 
look for certain indicators that they may be dealing with anthrax? I would rather have uh, Scott Lillibridge answer that question because he's in charge of that uh, particular portion of it. Just a few things, sir. Some of the things that they've done to help educate the medical community actually started uh, over the past several years, and they've included work with the American College of Emergency Physicians to help develop a curriculum that could be used to help educate their their staff, their officers, their uh, physicians that work in that guild. The other things that are going on presently in town and in more of a real-time effort is our work with HHS with the Department of Health, the District Department of Health. It has involved quite a bit of information, health alerts. It's involved um, some of the disease recognition activities and uh, a number of continuous press briefings to update the public on different aspects of cases as they emerge and information about how they may present and what to be on the lookout for. On a more long-term basis at a, and uh, national basis, things like the Health Alert Network are beginning to send out things, particularly during this event, on a more real-time event with clinical information about sensitivity to the drugs, uh, updates on clinical findings in terms of states and locations, and beginning to help people piece together the national mosaic of how this is fitting together. Um, I'm curious about the level of cooperation from DOD. I was in the Army for several years, and there were some fairly knowledgeable experts on uh, these issues, anthrax, bioterrorism in general. Um, and are you finding the level of cooperation to be very good? Are you getting a lot of data and, and help uh, from the experts in the various branches of the military that have been working in this arena? Uh, Congressman, we, we really have. <coughs> and we're cooperating very nicely. What I did is I took a, a hearing room down on the sixth floor of the Humphrey Building and, and turned it into a, a huge room, a, a clearinghouse, a conference room. And we have uh, people there from the Department of Defense and from FEMA and from the Public Health Service, and that is open 24 hours a day. We also have uh, uh, meetings every morning, uh, somewhere around 7.30, 8 o'clock, to get intel, and which is uh, from CIA, from the Department of Defense, from the FBI, and from the Public Health. And those uh, meetings are very good because we're we're exchanging information, and though that exchange of information is going on uh, throughout a 24-hour day, our hearing room downstairs is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, Scott Lillibridge, uh, Captain Lillibridge, is in charge of that, and he's pulled together a great team. It's right across uh, the the uh, corridor from my office, so I get over there very frequently to find out what's going on, and we also have meetings then uh, from the from the various agencies almost on a daily basis. I'm sure you've probably covered this already, but um, being a physician myself, I've had members of Congress approach me about just putting everybody on antibiotics, and um, I've had to explain that that may not be the appropriate thing to do. People can have side effects. Occasionally you get rare, serious side effects, mm -hmm. occasionally life-threatening side effects. Um, and at least in the case of the House and Senate exposure, the surveillance of testing the nasal swabs on the employees, uh, staff has shown that the original number of uh, 28 or 30 people uh, is limited to them, yeah. as I understand it, and uh, that it would be inappropriate to take all the thousands of people who work in these buildings and put them on antibiotics. And ditto for the uh, for the uh, postal workers, that it's appropriate for the ones at high risk to have been exposed to put them on antibiotics, but for the others um, to do the surveillance and determine if there has been an exposure level. I addressed that in my statement, uh, uh, Congressman Weldon, and I, I indicated we're going to be much more aggressive dealing with postal workers, and uh, when we find that there has been uh, an exposure, we're going to go in there and treat them with prophylactics. Uh, much more aggressively than we have in the past, just because we have found that uh, it needs to be done. Um, in I would certainly to support that, particularly the ones in that Brentwood facility. Right. Uh, and as I understand that part of the problem there was those letters came through a letter sorting machine that they clean at the end of the day with a 
compressed air gun, and it may have just... That's thrown the, the anthrax up in the air, and these poor souls may have inhaled uh, lethal, lethal amounts right at that time. Uh, that is uh, being uh, examined. We do not have uh, conclusive uh, evidence that that's what took place, but that is uh, part of the speculation that took place. Did you want to answer, uh, Captain? No, I just wanted to add and say that's exactly correct. Those, uh, those individuals at Brentwood are being uh, prophylaxed at this time, and an ongoing environmental investigation is in progress. In, in lieu of having all the results, we've gone ahead and erred on the side of caution and began to prophylax that, that population, as well as looking at the substations that drain or relate to Brentwood. I do want to mention two things. One, compliments to the mayor and the district health officer for their continued stewardship of this issue and keeping the message clear, informing the public, and uh, playing a key leadership role in, uh, in this response. Well, thank you very much. Before I yield back, I want to thank all of you for the hard work you're doing, particularly you, Mr. Secretary, and certainly uh, thank the President for uh, the leadership role he is providing uh, our nation in this arena. and. Uh, by him putting uh, all the resources of agencies like yours to work to combat this uh, terrorist attack, that uh, we will be able to be victorious uh, in the end, and America will be able to get back to business. And thank you so much, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman very much. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I I'm last here, and I have a number of questions. I'd like to see if I can get through them. Um, and I, and I want to say to you that, that besides what our committee has done for the last two and a half years, basically the members here were on a committee that oversaw HHS for four years before that. And we've seen the, the, the Department of Veterans Affairs for now eight years and have gotten issue, into issues like um, Gulf War illnesses and the whole military anthrax program. And so one of the questions I'm going to be asking is how your program differs uh, in terms of uh, anthrax to the needs of the military. Uh, but before I do that, I, I want to come back to the original question I had asked. And uh, it, it's clear that you are not a advocating that all, uh, dealing with smallpox, that all uh, Americans be vaccinated, That's true. Um, but that you are looking to have a greater supply. And it's clear that we have 15 million, 12 million of finest quality, and 3 million that's a little lesser quality, and you can dilute that. I just want to be very clear, though, in terms of the dilution, uh, the 5 to 1, will this be a sign-off by FDA or an acknowledgment that you've done it? Uh, and how, uh, I don't need to know about how we're going to determine the trial right now, because I want to get to other questions. But I, I need to know, really, whether FDA signs off on this, or are you going to overrule FDA and so on? Uh, FDA is working in collaboration with us, but I, I think Dr. Egan should uh, respond directly to that question. I think the dilution studies are being conducted under IND, so that it's, it's, right. it's you know, with, with the approval of the FDA. The FDA will oversee the trial. So if they're successful, so FDA will acknowledge that they're and sign off? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, I mean, that's being done now. Okay. Um, in terms of... Um, the uh, production of new small packs vac vaccine. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm interested that you have to go through the trials. You have basically three phases after you've, you've, you've dealt with the, the animal side of the, of the investigation. And, and I'm not talking about the typical argument that the pharmaceutical industry can say FDA takes too long. We're not talking about that kind of 12 years and sometimes the pharmaceutical companies can be at fault. Here we're talking about wanting it agreed to speed up as quickly as possible. But you still are going to do all three phases, correct? That's correct. That's and do you want to respond? Yeah. Well, uh, I think you're starting off at a better point. You're starting with, with a virus, uh, a vaccine virus that you've already worked with and you know is effective against uh, smallpox. It's eradicated smallpox in the world. So it's not like we're taking a disease isolating, a no, disease it's a isolating, vaccine. attenuating. It it's, it's a new vaccine um, in, in one way, in a sense, it's going into a different cell substrate. Uh, and, and there is the possibility of change there. Um, for example, using, you know, a human cell or, or a, um, you know, a, an animal derived cell. Nobody's going to make the vaccine on the skin of calves any, anymore. Right. We're going to do it uh, in cell substrates. And then look for or use the surrogate markers 
that we've got. Dr. Fauci talked earlier about looking at the take rate. So that's certainly one of the things that we'll look at. And we will at. do that with the new vaccine as well. And we look need. at that. We'll do that with the new vaccine, again, under, under IND, uh, looking for take rate, looking at immunological responses to the vaccine, comparing those to the currently licensed vaccine, to the, to the current vaccine, the Dryvax, uh, from Wyeth Lederley, and looking for similarity of immunological response, whether those yeah. immunological responses, you know, are, are that, cross neutral. That, that, that's going to tell you about the efficacy, but it may not tell you about the safety, correct? In other words, um, uh, we, with the old vaccine, one out of a million would literally die. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere, I hear the number 200,000 would have very serious, one out of 200,000 would have very serious adverse reaction, um, which which raised the question of the vaccinia immune globulin, which we aren't producing now, which is to deal with those who have adverse effect. And we have to go through a study, a, a trial on that as well with uh, VIG? No, I think, the, well, if, you, if you're going to be licensing new sources, going through studies to compare them with the currently licensed uh, material. And are we in the process of trying to get additional VIG as well? Yes. Okay. But we won't have to do more studies for that. Well, to compare those new sources or new preparations with older existing preparations. So there are some studies, yes. How will, um, going back to, uh, just now going to, to anthrax, our, our committee has taken exception to the mandatory program that the military had for anthrax. Um, for a variety of reasons, but one was it was sole sourced, another was that uh, it was an old vaccine and we had wasted m many years developing a new vaccine, six shots. They arbitrarily decided to give three shots instead of six, even though the protocol doesn't allow for that. They did it because ultimately they started to run out. We literally have a few 10,000 of it. I mean, we don't have a lot. That's public record. Uh, and, and the issue is um, uh, what kind of pressure ultimately how are we going to respond to Bioport? They have, they have 11 lots of it, about 200,000 a lot, I understand. We have but, about 5 million, Chris. But, but, but some of it is their new batch, and the, the right. other is old batch that has lost some of its efficacy, its potency. And so you all are going to have to, you all are going to have to make a decision on the new production, and you're going to have to make a decision on the two to three million of, of old lots uh, vaccines. And I'm interested to know whether you are basically going to just allow them to use it. Uh, I want to know what's happening here. I want to, I want to have a sense that that we aren't pressuring FDA into saying, okay, let's move forward because we have a national emergency. Are you asking the Secretary if he's pressuring FDA to do things? I'm, no, I'm asking I'm about the real concern. Let me just be real yeah, clear about it. Yeah, please. Uh, this is not new territory for us. We've seen, I mean, when during the Gulf War, we decided to have 700,000 of our troops take peridostigmine bromide, or what I call PB, and, and we used it as a prophylactic. Uh, it was an approved drug, but we used it in a prophylactic way. And there is some real questions as to whether that was advisable, and there were some real questions about whether the FDA shouldn't have stepped in, and there were real questions about whether protocol was followed. Uh, the troops weren't told about how they should take it, when they should take it. Records weren't kept on who took the PB, and so on. So I mean, I, it's it's this is a history that goes well beyond any secretary. And I'm just concerned we are in a warlike condition, and I would just like to know what the policy will be of the department. Will um, uh, let, let me answer that. Yeah. There's no question they have about five million uh, samples of uh, of uh, vaccine, uh, three million which is uh, licensable, uh, and two million which is going to have to be inspected. And FDA is going to have to do the inspection. FDA is going to have to go and inspect their new building that they're remodeling and or reconditioning a new building, but reconditioning and remodeling it. They have just filed as of last Friday an application for certification, and FDA will be going in there as soon as it's completed. 
If it's completed and it's up to uh, the specification that FDA approves, they should be operational by the 22nd of November. It was originally going to be the 15th. Now it looks like it's going to be the 22nd. But I can assure you, Congressman, nobody is pressuring FDA to approve this. There's been an ongoing uh, conflict uh, between FDA and Bioport for some time. And that conflict has been brought on mainly by Bioport from not performing a good manufacturing uh, uh, a good manufacturing system. They are improving that and modernizing and cleaning their plant. And now it will be going in and be inspected by FDA. And FDA will give it a very close and scrutinize very carefully all of the problems they've had in the past to make sure that it's up to, up to speed before it introduces and starts manufacturing again. As far as the five million, most of that will have to be reinspected. Yeah. Let me just say that, that this, uh, we are also asking the same question of the of DOD as well, because uh, uh, in this case it becomes an investigatory type drug. Uh, and I would want to know if we will uh, require informed consent by those who will be taking the drug. Where smallpox. If we move forward, we, I'm sorry, I'm jumping to smallpox. You jump to smallpox? Okay. Yeah, I'm Small sorry. Will it be done under IND? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that will require informed consent? When it's done under IND, yes, it does okay. require it. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry. To so jump the dilution from, studies. Yeah. No, he's talking about the new stuff. It will have you will have to be you will have to be informed, and the person before he receives a small packs would have to be informed and would have to give his or her consent. Right. Uh, Mr. Secretary, is there a question we should have asked that you wanted to uh, respond no, to? No, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you have the, well, uh, done a very effective job, and uh, I'm very happy to have you over here. And I, I hope you stop down and see our our room before you leave. We, but, we will stop down, and let me just. And I want to thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you and say the president and the country is fortunate to have you as secretary. Thank you very much, Congressman. We'll have a one-minute break, and then we'll call our next witnesses up. We are in Denver, Colorado, on the University of Denver's campus and we're in the facility known as the Cable Center. The Cable Center uh, construction started um, 